Hello everyone, welcome to episode 44 of the Day Zero podcast, uh, our return after a fairly long break. So, you know, uh, we took the summer off. Unfortunately, conferences were, were cancelled. So, we, you know, last time when we took a break, we talked about like DEF CON and Anti talked about Black Hat and all those conferences. <laughs> Can't really do that uh, today. Um, and we actually have a topic related to that coming up soon. Um, but one thing that did happen over the summer because of the pandemic uh, and all that kind of stuff, there was a lot of bounties that were were starting to get published, like right after we took the break on the podcast, of course, which, you know, it, it makes sense that more people would be at home, you know, doing bounty stuff, they would have time to do that. So, um, you know, that all started happening right after we did the podcast. Uh, we also had some PS4 streams, which I think we'll probably put up on YouTube. Uh, we didn't, you know, fully go through with Im implementing the exploit because I was actually going on vacation um, shortly after we did the PS4 streams. But, you know, uh, we will probably put those up on YouTube. The VODs still might be on Twitch for people who want to see that before we get to that. Um, but, you know, that was happening. But we've also, some of you may notice who are watching, uh, we've made some visual updates to the podcast as well. We've got a fancy new scene set up, which I think will, uh, will look a, a lot better. And we're going to be coming back with a stronger focus on content. So, you know, that includes the weekly podcasts. Uh, we're going to be doing bi-weekly discussion videos, which we're going to be starting this week as well, uh, coming out on Thursday. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and we're going to try to build up the community a little bit more. So with that said, feel free to join our Discord. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, we have the, I think we have the Discord command. Uh I'm actually not even sure if I can use it on this account, but I think we have the Discord command. Yeah, Z just used it. So you can go ahead and join us there. Um, but yeah, uh, with that said, uh, some of the topics we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about CCC um, and how that is being made a virtual conference this year. Uh, some Linux and FreeBSD kernel bugs, the glorious NVIDIA takeover of ARM that a lot of people are really not happy about, uh, some Project Zero research, and uh, some other things we've got sprinkled in there. So. We were just talking about conferences and let's segue into uh, CCC. So last year was my first year at CCC and I really liked it. I thought it was a really good conference. Um, I liked it a lot more than DEF CON actually. And I think you kind of had the same opinion as me on that, don't you Z? Yeah, I've definitely kind of preferred CCC. Um, I spoke there a few years back, well, more than a few years now, but oh no, I felt like just as a community, like CCC was, it was less exactly hacker focused or at least it was hacker focused in the wider sense of the term focusing on uh, hacking in all of its different senses not just like the really technical stuff like you kind of go with defcon uh, so i really appreciate the conference just met a lot of cool people there even though my stay was fairly short yeah ccc generally like the content's great yeah i'm i'm a fan and one thing I liked about CCC as well is it is a little, they limit how many people can go by the ticket sales, right? And I found that that made it so that it was a lot easier to socialize with people at CCC than it was at DEF CON because there's not 30,000 people in a casino. You know, when you're, you're when you're grouped together like sardines in a tin can, it's a lot harder to really socialize and be able to do stuff in workshops and stuff like that. So I found CCC was uh, was a lot you know better for that as well. Unfortunately, uh, th those social interactions are not going to be happening this year for obvious reasons. So, um, you know, we kind of figured this was going to happen as time dragged on. It didn't really seem like the virus was going to show any signs of stopping. Uh, even here in Canada, uh, when we started opening up even a little bit, cases have been rising. There's been the talk about the second wave. So it was pretty much guaranteed the CCC wasn't going to be happening this year. Um, and conferences are already breeding grounds for viruses and people getting sick in the past. So it sucks. You know, CC is cool. Um, I would have liked to experience it again this year. But they are going to be doing a virtual conference. Um, so they're calling it RC3, the Remote Chaos Experience. Now, one thing I will say is CCC has always had the remote live viewing of talks, which I've always really liked. So even if you couldn't go to the con, uh, you know, the conference, which happened to me two years ago uh you could actually see the talks as they were happening online whereas something with defcon you know you got to wait a few months before the vods go up so in yeah, that which, sense you know I'll, CCC already kind of has a leg up i'll kind of agree there that um 
the live presentations there are really nice with CCCF. I mean, the hours are a little bit weird when it comes down to, you know, being for over us, here in Canada. Great. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're not great, but it is fun to kind of have a bit of a watch party with a few friends for that and, you know, staying up pretty much to watch them or getting up early, whichever side of it you want to follow on. Uh, so, so, I mean, I'm hoping, you know, maybe this year uh, with it being remote, maybe there's going to be a bit more interest in that and kind of hang out because I... I mean, I just have people kind of invite, you know, whoever to watch it with, and we just chat as it goes on. So I'm hoping maybe because of the, there have been more of those remote conferences, it's going to be a bit more interesting kind of just doing that and doing that sort of watch party around some of the talks. Yeah, I like to do that with some of the people in the uh, the RE server. We like to talk about, especially like the exploitation focused talks and stuff like that. Because um, that is another thing with CCC is they seem to have a lot broader of a range of talks kind of like what you were talking about earlier where it's not all technical they also have some talks related to like the political landscape of uh of you know infosec and stuff like that which you know some people like some people probably don't really care for it but it's nice that that option is there so there is a lot more of a variety of talks which is cool as well um so ccc while they have always had the you know remote talks uh viewing experience they're also going to add on a few things this year for the remote conference. They're going to be having online workshops. Um, and they're also accepting ideas and feedback for anyone that, you know, uh, wants to suggest ideas of, you know, what can, what you can do with the conference. So I, th I thought we could use this as kind of a springboard to talk about how we feel about virtual conferences in general, though. Um, particularly like, not only around just CCC, but also like DEF CON and stuff like that. Did you like check out any like the DEF CON talks or anything like that this year? Um, I watched a couple. I don't know. I mean, I, I was also in the DEF CON Discord. Uh, so. I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of how some of them run. On one hand, I'm absolutely a fan of how things have opened up a little bit more being virtual more people are able to access the content in an easier way i mean with defcon that's not a big deal like the videos have always kind of gone gone online anyhow it just takes a long time yeah uh so having the discord i mean i didn't participate too much in it oh no it's I kind of have mixed feelings. I'm glad that there's more of a move to kind of support that remote access. I'd hope in the future they can maybe do the same thing. You just open it up to people who aren't attending. They need to make their money, though, so I don't know if that'll actually work. But, I mean, on one I mean, hand, I like how it's getting opened up. Go ahead. So, uh, regarding, like, needing to make the money... I can kind of see that, but at the same time, especially with something like DEF CON, I don't think many people are buying the tickets to see the talks. You know what I mean? I, I think what makes conferences so attractive is the social aspect, right? Networking, meeting up with people. Um, you can you know, pretty like, easily attend DEF CON without even needing a ticket. You can do oh, a lot without a yeah, We snuck a, a friend in like two years ago. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, I wasn't even thinking sneaking somebody in. I was just saying, like, you don't need a ticket. Like, you could do plenty no. without, like, ignoring, you know, ignore the villages and all that. I mean, everybody in the industry tends to show up at DEF CON, at least over here in North America. I mean, you just with that. One, though. <laughs> but, well, um, I mean, there's also the counterfeit badge contest. Yeah, true. Um, but yeah, like the the big thing with cons is being able to meet up with people that you talk to online often. That was like really cool to be able to do. But that's the exact thing we're trying to avoid this year. So I think virtual conferences are a net benefit in the way that we still get the talks, but they'll just never really be able to replace the traditional conference experience. No, it doesn't replace the in-person thing at all. I agree. Yeah. So in terms of dates, uh, the date is basically unchanged from previous years. It's right after Christmas. They have it running from December 27th to uh, December 30th. So, you know, we're probably going to be doing the watch parties and stuff like that. And uh, I imagine there's probably people listening who would be interested in doing that too. So we're shutting out the date. With that, we'll move into uh, some of our more spicier topics. NVIDIA. So this has been blowing up, especially over the last couple days, because... Uh, it well the official press release was just made yesterday so it's not necessarily infosec or exploit related but it's a huge story that can affect tech and by extension people interested in infosec as a whole and um 
it, we, we are truly in the darkest timeline, it would seem. So people are, are really worried about this acquisition uh, with NVIDIA acquiring ARM because NVIDIA's been kind of openly hostile in the past and they have a vested interest in leveraging their position against competitors and arm is huge in the embedded uh iot space the mobile industry uh and even infosec like think of some of the hardware based devices used for various things uh you know you got the raspberry pi uh there was a thing we were talking about yesterday z which was the rf radio or something like that i think it was called i can't remember the exact name hack rf hack rf yeah that's what it was so you know there's ARM is used in a lot of places, and as far as I understand it, current licensees do have licenses to use ARM in perpetuity. Um, like, I don't think NVIDIA can just retroactively revoke licenses or anything like that, but where it kind of worries me for things like the Raspberry Pi and those kinds of products is we could see licenses for newer chips not being granted, or the prices being hiked on those licenses and being transferred to the consumer uh to you know to compensate for those licensing increase costs so this is all speculation obviously but these are the types of concerns that people are expressing um so softbank just bought arm like four years ago for 32 billion and now they're selling it for 40 billion to nvidia i, I don't know how you feel about this decision i feel like from a business standpoint it seems kind of dumb it doesn't seem like arm is going to be going anywhere anytime soon it seems like it's going to get nothing but bigger um, there is a drive to move away from x86, as we can see with like the newer MacBooks and stuff from Apple. Um, so yeah, I mean, what do you think about, do you think that some of the, I guess, speculations and worries are founded? I think there's definitely some room for worry. Uh, at the same time, there are some potential benefits of it too, but in terms of the worry, I mean, NVIDIA has at least a little bit of a history when it comes to uh, basically trying to extort companies to pay them on their, well, patents, I think was a, oh, no, I remember, I don't recall the details, but it was, it had to do with um, NVIDIA and basically what ended up getting them kind of fully kicked off the Apple platform, which was when they tried to patent uh, their graphics architecture. Um. And then, you know, try get, try get everybody using it to go pay them for that patent. And a bunch of companies were just like, no. Uh, so, I mean, NVIDIA's kind of done that before. So, I mean, there's definitely the concern that they're going to try and do that again. Uh, there's kind of the question of why they've gone ahead and bought. I, I kind of mentioned this a little bit ago um, with kind of branching out into the server realm. And I feel like that might be what's going on here. Uh, but, uh, or, go ahead. So, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. I was kind of thinking the same thing. NVIDIA's big thing has always been GPUs. So, but they have had the, their, like, Tigra line of chips, which the Nintendo Switch runs, for instance. So they have always kind of had processors. They're just not really, like, that big. Um, some of the speculation I've seen is, like, they're, they might even integrate ARM into their GPU somehow. I don't know how that would work or how beneficial that would be, but well, so that my could be guess, interesting to see. My guess, I mean, they mention it actually a bit about having the more of an AI focus being, uh, having this as being part of their attempt to establish themselves in AI. And I mean, obviously the GPU matters for that. But tossing on an ARM chip to that low power, that's going to be something servers can run to offer a bit more of an uh, AI platform. Uh, by having those the ARM chips as just kind of attached, a low power chip attached onto the GPU. The GPU is the main focus and kind of keeping it all within NVIDIA. So like it kind of makes sense there. I don't really I can't really see what they're trying to do though that would require they buy ARM rather than just licensing the ARM. Yeah. That that's the big thing that you know I, I don't get where they're going with that. Obviously they have some thought. They have some idea on wh how they're going to get their money back. Part of that could just be that they're going to, you know, use their experience with research and development on GPUs, apply that into ARM. This could be a good thing for ARM, too. I mean, we're all doom and gloom right now, but it can be a positive thing, too. Having that, uh, having that background that NVIDIA already has there, being able to apply that into the CPU arena with ARM. Um, and if they do push into the server adoption, that can also be uh, pulling a little bit more of the... Basically, more adoption onto risk machines. 
Uh, and we were talking, uh, you know, a while back here before we went on the break about, you know, risk adoption. And th this can kind of push that forward. And I don't think uh, that's necessarily a bad, a bad thing. Yeah, so one thing that, that people have been kind of hyped about a little bit from this announcement is people are thinking companies might want to start jumping chip from ARM just to prevent the possibility from even being strong-armed strong, strong -armed by NVIDIA. And people are thinking, you know, could this be the the rise of RISC-V? Which, RISC-V has been around for a while, but it's it, it's like an open source design spec, right? And the problem is it doesn't really have the backing to really push it to like mainline like mainstream uh chips so there is kind of a you know thought that maybe risk v will take off off of this i don't necessarily agree with that stance i don't know if risk v is really oh i don't close think enough so. to be able to take that position I, yeah. I don't think it will like just to be clear like arm is a risk machine you know advanced risk machine arm yeah. um uh, so like when i'm talking about risk going on the uptake i am implying with that being the arm variant there oh yeah i know but when you mentioned risk and stuff like that that kind of prompted me to remember that you know there is like this big discussion around this risk v as well so it'll be kind of interesting to see where that goes it feels a little bit like the microsoft acquisition of github you know there's a lot hmm, of doom and gloom comparison. around that uh about how you know microsoft's going to ruin github um everybody kind of going off it to go to uh GitLab. Um, and obviously, like, GitLab did see some some increase in users, but the overall thing hasn't been as bad as it seems, or as it was predicted to be. Um, and I feel like any talk about risk V taking off is going to fall into that category. That said, in all fairness, I'm basically just speaking out of my ass with that. I don't have <laughs> a lot of experience to say, like, oh, yeah, this is going to take off, and I'll make those decisions. So I'm just going from what I see and my unrelated background a lot of this is speculation to be fair so um so to be fair to nvidia they do say in their press release that nvidia will continue arms open source licensing model and customer neutrality and expand arms ip licensing portfolio with nvidia technology so they do kind of you know um state right there that they are going to continue the open you know the open licensing model so if they kind of backtrack on that and start you know, going after companies and trying to strong arm people, I could see that really blowing up on them in like the PR department. Oh, so, for sure. Um, yeah, it, like it'll absolutely blow up on me, especially because now you've also got people who are going to be able to say, you know, I called it if they go and do that. Yeah. So they did also host a webcast at 5 30 a.m pacific time this morning about the transaction for those interested it seems to be more like investor oriented i actually didn't check it out because i i definitely wasn't up at 5 30 in the morning pacific or uh I, that would have been 7 30 in the morning for me so uh or actually no 8 30 so yeah the, that might be something that some people might want to check out but it's probably not really super technical it's it's more for investors from what i understand um, but yeah, not too much more to say there. Just will be interesting to see going forward what happens with ARM, uh, you know, in the future, within the next couple of years. Yeah, like I will say, as I was kind of mentioning there about the risk adoption, uh, I'm not, like I like, in, in a sense, from the security perspective, I think risk adoption can be a very positive thing because risk has been kind of pushing the envelope a little bit in terms of the hardware enforcement, some mitigations, in terms of some... CPU level mitigations, um, maybe not pushing the envelope, but I mean, there is Intel CET, which has been doing some new things too, but there has been a little bit more, at least feels like a little bit more innovation there. Uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing like ARM adoption go up. I mean, it'll make kind of our job harder, but I mean, from a security perspective, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think people like working with ARM at the low level in general more than x86. Oh yeah, Risk um, is much nicer to work with. Yeah, you don't have a billion extension sets. Like, there's literally a Twitter account built on... You could you could pretty much just smash your keyboard and come up with an x86 instruction. Um, and the other thing, like you were bringing up the security angle, the other thing that Risk kind of passively provides you is the fact that uh, ROP is a lot harder, right? Because you're you don't get the mid-instruction stream gadgets like you do with uh, x86. 
Um, obviously, ROP is still possible. You know, we still see ROP chains on like iPhone and Android and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that that could potentially tackle the problem that researchers have been trying to try to solve for years with the availability of ROP gadgets. We've seen so many like white papers trying to limit gadgets, and it just doesn't really seem feasible without having a mass massive performance overhead. So, you know, that is another thing that's worth considering with ARM as well, um, that it kind of passively provides along with the mitigations that you brought up. With that said, we'll move on to uh, offensive security. So we've talked about uh, offensive security in the past. I think you did a review of, uh, what was it, OSWP? W-E. Uh, w -E, their web, right. web expert or web offensive security, web exploitation expert, I think, or something. Uh, something, something like that. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I did that back when I did the course. Um, with this one, though, it's a little bit... I did OSCE back 2014, I think. It, like, it, it was a good while ago. Like, it's been around for a while, whereas OSW was new. But they're finally kind of sunsetting, uh, cracking the perimeter, which was the course that you took before getting the OSCE certification. Which, I mean, it's... It's a bit sad because, you know, I'm a holder of that, but I've said for a long time, like right from the time I got it, it's probably one of the more useless certifications out there just because it doesn't really certify you on anything that matters. Because I, as kind of a quick summary, uh, OSCE was kind of the certification course that was often kind of touted between the Exploitation Expert course, which was like their Windows advanced windows exploitation course and oscp the pen testing one uh, osc was kind of touted as being in between there it has a a lot of the rumors about it and just kind of talk about tend to focus on the exploit development part of uh, osc which basically gets you up to like 2007 2008 cell exploits like single gad not like one gadget but just a uh, single gadget type exploits where you might you know return to a gadget that returns to the uh, code on the stack or something like that's kind of the level of exploits there. So no ROP, nothing, nothing modern that you're actually going to or use these days. So the exploit dev section just wasn't really valuable. It had a web section also uh, covered. One thing I do like about defense scares, they do place some uh, emphasis on kind of chaining issues. Uh, where you kind of have one issue and then you chain it with another issue to kind of have a higher uh, higher impact. So the web section was okay, uh, but still just kind of very limited. It covered like two things. Like literally, it was like two, you did two exploits and that was it, if I recall correctly. And then they had a pen testing section doing some old school antivirus evasion, encryptors and stuff. Yeah. So essentially what seems to be happening here is OSCE uh, and cracking the perimeter uh, are getting sunset on October 15th. So this is to allow a transition to new courses and certs, which I don't think they've announced yet. They're saying, you know, those courses are going to be, uh, you know, talked about in the coming months, but they're not, you know, ready yet for, for talking about so publicly. So Advanced Web, the reason why I was giving kind of the overview of the class itself was because uh, it's basically broken up into those three sections, the pen testing section, the exploit development section and the web attack section. So the OSWE, the web attack stuff, that certification is kind of the first step in their breaking out OSCE into three certifications. So OSWE is the first one covering that web section. Then they're going to do an exploit one, an exploit dev certification and a separate pen testing one. I think that's a positive move because as it stood, OSC just kind of, it covered these topics, but didn't cover any of them well enough to matter, uh, to actually be a certification. Uh, so yeah, what they're doing mm -hmm. now is they're breaking it up into those three certifications, which they haven't released yet, except for OSWE. Um, I do look forward to seeing what they do with a exploit dev course, because I do think having a exploit dev course that has a lab like OSCP for exploit dev would be, you know, really valuable to people learning, having that sort of setup. Generally, all of their other labs besides OSCP are very simple. 
OSW is no different. It just runs of the programs I do the exploits on. But I do think it's a good move because OSC just hasn't really had much value in my opinion. So it is worth noting uh, that they're not going to retroactively revoke certs if you already have them by that point. And you can register for OSCE uh, like before they change it until October 15th. So it seems like if you did want to get it bef and get the same certification before they change uh, the process of getting it, you know, now would probably be a good time to do that. Um, I don't know why you would. I, I mean, so here, here's my thing. On one side, I kind of see what you're saying with needing the three courses for the new OSCE cert could like add more value to the certification itself. At the same time, I, you know, playing devil's advocate, I could see people being upset that they now have to pay for three different courses to get one cert where they didn't have to do that before. I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, because like okay. I said, OSWE, which is its own certification, was the first step. They mentioned that here. Uh, that those two certifications plus OSWE certification will comprise the new updated OSC. Uh, so you're still getting two other certifications. Like, you're still getting a cert for those other two. It's not you need all three and then you get a cert. Although it does sound like when you also complete those three, you're getting yet another cert. Yeah, but you can't get OSCE without getting the bundle, is what I'm kind of getting at there. So I can see yeah, people I think like, they'll taking have that value. the wrong way. I think they'll have value, though, as their standalone certifications, more so than the group of them. Like I said, OSCE just kind of... It covered, it also kind of tried to cover too much. Like, there are very few jobs where you're going to be doing all of that. You're going to be doing the pen testing and you're going to be doing the exploit development. I mean, yes, exploit dev knowledge does help when you're doing the pen testing. Uh, but they are different jobs, and I think the certs will stand on their own. It's like we've kind of said in the past, you're not really going to be deploying zero days in a pen test. <laughs> Generally Whereas, not, yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you think that... OSCE will be, I guess, uh, more valued as a cert by employers as well as a result, you know, uh, in the in the near future? Or it's, do you think that it might not, it might be held back by the fact that they're not revoking people who already have OSCE? Oh, I don't think the revoking will matter because anybody's going to be able to just know if it's new or old. Like, oh, did they get this in like, you know, since whatever year they introduced it or not? Like, it's not, That's true. I don't think it's going to be a huge issue. Okay. Um, one question I'll chat from, uh, I'm going to call him the face because his name kind of looks like a face, but oil <laughs> uh, is just asking, um, if the exploit dev course spawning from the window is user line focus, uh, sorry, I'm just reading it here. Basically saying they're doing yeah. windows user line focus, but dropping Linux is... I don't remember seeing that, though. Yeah, neither do I, actually. Uh, they could have mentioned it elsewhere. Oh, it's from their blog post. Okay. Um, so that is interesting. I was kind of hoping that this might also be their move to bring OSE to, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the online option. Uh, that said... I mean, a lot of exploitation does happen on Windows, so I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing uh, for them to be doing the focus on just Windows user land. Yeah, when I'm searching user land in the page, yeah, well, user uh, I'm not mode getting anything. Pulls it up. Oh, user mode pulls it up. Okay. I'm just trying to find it myself. Um... Man. Chrome is doing some weird things for me right now. Um, okay, yeah, oh yeah, Windows user mode exploit development. So yeah, that's always been kind of the weird thing with a lot of exploit dev courses, is it seems like a lot of them only focus on one or the other um, in either Linux or Windows. That being said, there is a lot of similarities. Like at the base level, you're finding bugs. The types of bugs you're going to find in Windows and Linux are going to be generally the same. It's just how you're exploiting them is going to be different. So I don't think it's a huge problem, um, but I do think, you know, having both in the course is definitely like a net benefit, knowing how to exploit in both environments, even if you never plan to do 
you know, like I focus entirely on like Unix, you know, type exploits. I've never really written a Windows type exploit, but there are some times where I wish I kind of had that knowledge. You know, there's discussion around Windows bugs and stuff like that, where there's terms being used that I don't really, I'm not really familiar with because of that lack of experience in that. So it would be nice if there were both, but at the same time, I think people place too much value on the platform specifics uh, regarding exploitation. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I guess, a general problem is when you don't know a ton about it, you kind of imagine, okay, if I'm only learning Windows, then what I'm learning is only applicable to Windows. And that's generally not the case. Like, there are some specific issues that you need to deal with on Windows that you don't on Linux or vice versa. But generally speaking, your concepts do remain the same. I'd say that maybe deviates a bit as you start hitting kernel kernel mode stuff because that you know depends a little bit more on well the kernel but generally speaking i i would have expected them to go linux just because you know that's free for them to use and teach on whereas if they're going to be offering a lab environment with windows they've obviously got to pay all the licensing on that which is not cheap it is a uh, microsoft expects a pretty penny for the for those licenses per machine so that's part of the reason, like, in CTS and stuff, you don't really see Windows challenges either, is because it's just not really feasible to run them too expensive. Yeah, and you don't want to run a CTF challenge under Wine. Yeah. Huh. Um, another point from chat, uh, that begs the question, why do they mention slash sell it that way? Probably because they think more people are going to be interested in Windows exploitation than Linux, because, especially with, like, pen testing and stuff like that, generally you're probably going to be hitting Windows systems. Um, depends on where you're at with that because obviously like enterprises corporate networks are going to be running both Windows and Linux they're going to be doing stuff over the network hitting services on Linux machines but browser exploitation anything client side you're likely hitting Windows people are more familiar with Windows yeah uh, and then another question from chat about um, nobody offers iOS or Android specific exploitation courses I'm not sure about Android. I know there are iOS exploitation courses. Um, I've seen one before by Stefan Esser. I don't know if he's still doing them, but there are there are and have been uh, iOS ones, at least in the past. I imagine there probably have been Android ones. I just haven't really gone looking for them. Um, I don't know if you can think of any off uh, top of your so head. So I'm thinking Z. of Ring Zero training. Um, I've just pulled them up. Uh, they, unfortunately, I think all of their trainings are done now because they ran out in August. But generally, you'll find something more specific stuff like um, iOS. Yeah, iOS 13 users, user space exploitation. Yeah, there you uh, go. That was the one I think you were just mentioning. Like, they are run. Um, generally, more as training. So what you'd want to do is look at, like, a conference coming up see if they have any training going on before and you can find some more specific trainings like that i can't think of any like certification like offensive security that covers ios though i can't either um the other thing that's interesting though getting into that with the trainings is a lot of the trainings are like in person at conferences um are those really happening right now because well, like are they online. doing virtual trainings okay so they're they were online okay so yeah, all of these were also like uh yeah, forty two hundred dollars for you know a four day course. Yeah, those trainings can get expensive. <laughs> look out yeah. for that if you're if you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna do one of these trainings. Look look at the price tags because how a lot of the trainings works uh, is th they'll be company sponsored, right? So you'll get somebody who's working at a company and they'll be like, I want to take this training. I think it'll help me with uh you know what I'm doing here, and then the company will sponsor it. So that's why they're you know, a little bit heftier in the prices and stuff like that, too. Yeah. Um, that said, we'll move on to a ne our next article, which has a cheeky title. I like it. Uh, by Digital Interruption. It's about Giggle, which I haven't heard about before, but it's apparently a girls-only platform for social networking, which is probably why I haven't heard about it before. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they talk about looking into this application. Uh, they started looking at it with Burp Suite and you know, looked at the network traffic as kind of their first step of uh, recon. And uh, one of the first things they found when they were playing with the app was that uh, you need a selfie and a phone number to verify your account. But you would still get a valid auth token even if you didn't verify your account. 
and that auth token was hard coded in tap. So you could basically make requests to the API without validating the account. And one of these API endpoints was the user list endpoint, which would provide information on an account based on a filter that you provided. So you could filter by like the user ID, phone number, stuff like that. Um, yeah, and the, the information returned can include like some pretty sensitive personal information. I found it a little bit interesting here that it had the filter parameter and then they have this sort of object that's field operator and value that you're looking for. Uh, this one kind of felt, I, I don't recognize this, but it feels like this is probably like, it's almost like SQL injection without the SQL or the injection. It's just a feature. You can set what you want. Um, and instead of SQL, it looks like something else. I can't quite match it. It reminds me a little bit of like Mongo searches, but it, it's clear it's clearly not. It's not Elasticsearch, but it kind of has that feel to it. It feels like they might just be piping this into some backend service. Uh pretty much as is. Or maybe that's how they decide to do it, but it still kind of comes across the case of uh just implementing like a too generic of an interface like they don't need to support just generic queries coming in from the app they can be a little bit more specific with that and that will have let them maybe put a little bit more protection around what's being returned and so if you could search anything and you get everything that's in you know whatever row or document or whatever type of uh, storage this is it's a very powerful querying capability to expose yeah um because part of the problem is you know you can get all this information if you have an account ID or a phone number, which is already bad enough. But on top of that, you can also change the equal operator to something else like contains. And then with that, you could actually dump like a whole list of users by just doing like contains one in the user ID or some common number or something like that, which they point out. Yeah, which I mean is effectively game over. Like basically that's why I said SQL injection without the SQL or injection. Like it's a feature. It's very much like SQL injection, though, where you kind of craft your query to get out more information. And, I mean, this is exposing, so we're talking about being able to query this. This is exposing, like, mobile phone numbers, geolocation information, uh, those selfies needed to verify your account first get on. You're able to expose those. You're able to see, like, uh, what groups or whatever somebody has joined. So they talk about there being, you know, victims of abuse on here, kind of having a little support group able to pull out their number and geolocation probably isn't the best thing to just expose out to the internet and to everybody. Yeah. I mean, there's a powerful quote in here from the author that basically states with this information, an attacker would know my address, my, my personal uh, phone number and what I look like. Like that's a powerful combination of stuff, especially for like targeted attacks. If you know that somebody you're targeting uses that app. Um, so the other thing they found incidentally was that account information wasn't deleted when the account is deleted. Uh, basically, they tried deleting an account and then using that API to look up the information, and they were still able to get that information. Um, so yeah, all it of just this... had whatever flag set there. The um, like disabled, I think, was the flag that was set when you deleted it, rather than actually deleting it. Yeah. So all of this was already kind of bad enough, but then there's more drama attached to it because of how they responded. Um, basically the, the founder of Giggle named Sal, I think is how you say it. Um, they basically use their fan base to attack, uh, digital interruption, accusing them of making the vulnerability up to discredit the company, um, being misogynistic and trying to like stir up all these accusations against them to just definitely not the way to respond to bug reports. De definitely a lot of drama kind of started about that because there is a political slant to this. It is a gendered yeah. social media thing. Uh, there were some comments like uh, that they're hypocrites for wanting to protect the data of users despite uh, having a view they disagree with. Or I think one comment was like men should not have a say on the safety of women uh, and their personal data. That just kind of made me like kind of think like, you know, what? Um, <sighs> privacy and data is a human thing. It doesn't it's change not gender specific. your gender. It doesn't yeah. care. <laughs> I mean, this just shouldn't happen. I don't care if it's a white supremacist site. They still shouldn't do that. Like, they still shouldn't be exposing everything. It's still personal information. Yeah. Um, and according to a note in the article, digital interruption was also threatened with legal action, apparently. 
I they didn't really mention that too much in the article, but that was like an edit uh, at the at the top of the post. So, I mean, um, man, one thing we've always kind of said in the past was what matters the most is the response uh, a lot more than the issue. And uh, I think here they they failed with flying colors. <laughs> yeah, that's this... that's been my kind of thing is, I mean, yeah, the issues definitely still matter, like some really trivial issues. Like they've raised questions about with the overall quality of an application. But if they respond positively to a report, you know, make the appropriate changes, document it, they're open, they're transparent. That's great. Like, that's what you want to see from a company. Everybody makes security mistakes. It's hard to get it right 100% of the time. I'm willing to overlook some things if a company has a good response. This is not a good response. Uh, you know, one, making it a political thing, uh, getting in there and, and you know, basically trying to discredit the reporters and all of that. That is not an appropriate response to a security issue. Though at the same time, I do see the tweet, and I will say the one tweet that they sent here, um, uh, I'll just read it out here. Uh, Add join a giggle. We sent you a DM. Whilst we disagree with a lot of the views of cell tweets, we want to discuss something that could impact your users and their privacy. That, this is something I think some security researchers do. It just comes across as super vague and unclear about what they're talking about. Now, I believe they had reached out with more information, or at least other information, in a DM prior to this. Yeah, um, I think but, that's what the screenshot above uh, the tweet you're talking about is related to. Yeah, but at the same time, when they put out those public ones, like, that does come across as it could be sort of a fear-mongering type thing. Like, oh, we've got this really vague thing that impacts users and privacy. Um, I still don't think the response was appropriate to it. But I do feel like being vague a lot of times just doesn't help anybody. Not that I expect them to be like, yeah, here's a vulnerability and, like, XYZ component, like, giving all the details publicly. Of course, that's not good either. It just, I feel like the vagueness kind of works against us. Uh, in terms of reporting. Um. So one thing I do kind of wonder here that I don't remember really seeing in the article is I'm guessing Giggle doesn't have an official channel to report like vulnerabilities or anything because it seems um, yeah, sometimes see we mentioned. do see sometimes we do see researchers send bug reports through Twitter even though there are like official channels and that does seem like uh like a lot of the people operating those Twitter accounts, they don't really have any idea of what you're talking about, right? It's like some PR person usually. Um, that being said, I don't know if that's like the case here. Um, there probably wasn't an official channel. Usually Twitter is like a last resort, which is yet another indictment, if that's true, on the company itself. I think, you know, it's 2020. I think it's fair to expect social media platforms and stuff like that to have official channels for bug reports. It's would, not like a unrealistic expectation. I would genuinely be surprised if they didn't have an email listed somewhere. Maybe not for security, but just for contact in general. Yeah. But it's hard to really... I don't want to say too much on that just because I, I don't know all the facts around that. And I don't want to, you know, speculate too much. Um, so, you know, if they don't have like a, a an official channel set up for that, they should probably set one up. Um, now, it is worth mentioning they did apologize, apparently. Um, the issue was addressed, they fixed it, and an apology was made. But it is still, like, I... The first response 2020. was completely irresponsible. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, it just kind of proves, that first response kind of proves that they don't really care about the security issues, they just care about looking bad. And that kind of, like... They they even only issued the apology after all of this was kind of outed, right? So it's like, did they apologize because they actually felt bad about how they responded, or did they apologize for damage control? <laughs> um, so yeah, it seems like they just care about looking bad, and the irony is they looked even worse with their first response. So yeah, yeah overall, well, it's like somebody said from chat, it's a good uh, good example of what not to do when you're responding to an issue. Yeah, very much. Uh, were you going to add something there? I know I kind of uh, started talking there when you were unmuting. Oh, that's all right. Okay. So we'll move uh, away from some of the, you know, drama. And we'll get into some exploits. So our first one is the raccoon attack. So more named vulnerabilities. 
Uh, this one, a side channel attack on the TLS specification, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I know you brought this up, Z, so I don't know if you want to, uh, if you want the pleasure of going into the technical details. Yeah, I'll I'll jump into it a little bit. I mean, as it's trying to come out, timing vulnerability in the specification itself. Uh, in particular, what goes on here is uh, when doing part of the TLS calculations, one thing that happens is when computing the pre-master secret or the, the secret that actually is going to be used based on pre-master. But um, if the pre-master starts with zero or, you know, if, uh, if they're doing like ephemeral keys, if the key starts with a zero, it'll trim uh, the zeros out of it. If the most significant bits are zero, they just get trimmed. So that leads to a timing difference in terms of how long the computation takes when that gets pass passed into a uh, key derivation function. Uh, again, just like taking pre-master, uh, toss it into the key derivation function, getting the value that's actually going to end up being used. Uh, so when that timing difference exists, if it starts at the zero versus if it doesn't start with the zero, uh, they're able to know at least the first few bits of it by, are those most significant bits zero? Doesn't sound like a huge issue, and it's not on its own. I mean, being able to tell that the first bits of the key are zero matters. It definitely like cuts down on the brute force that would be needed to break the key. But it's not like this huge break. Everything's just going to, you know, go crazy and, you know, all TLS is broken. That said, in conjunction with some other research that goes beyond me, so I'm not going to be able to dig too much into it uh, in terms of like the hidden number problem. Uh, going from this oracle about the most significant bits, you can start crafting a few questions to ask, like, okay, does this question result in a value that starts at zero? Does this, uh, does this value result in a zero? Does this value? And you can kind of work through that to work through the values of the key to figure it out. Um, the exact specifics on what numbers to ask, so that's separate research that they uh, mention in the paper itself. And what notes, if you want to dig into it, you know, you're going to have to read the paper. Uh, but the interesting idea there is just, that timing attack. It's also worth noting, um, as uh, uh, Denny, I think, in chat just mentioned, he has super fast connection for this. Uh, I was thinking about that. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, so if you tie this in, so timing attacks over the network usually are kind of seen as impractical. It's really hard because over the network, you've got a lot of issues where, like, anything can cause problems. Um, anything can kind of throw off your timing a little bit. And one way around that I'm not, actually, I guess, I've written it down in my notes as something to look into, fair with, but now that I'm thinking about it, it wouldn't, this particular trick wouldn't work. But the first thing that came to mind was combining this with, uh, like, HTTP2. But because this is TLS, that's going to be before you get the HTTP2. But um, the idea there is that you would include two requests in one packet. Uh, so I'm not sure offhand if you would be able to do something similar with uh, TLS. Uh, but the idea with those attacks that allow you to do timing attacks over the network would be, and this is, again, it won't necessarily impact this one. It's just the thought I had. But with those, you would have your HTTP request that would be doing the timing attack. Um, and since they're both in the same packet, you can kind of know which one was faster or slower than the other in terms of the order that you get them back. You get the responses to them. Uh, but going out there is going to be the same because they're in just one packet. Uh, port Swigger. This came from uh, some Port Swigger research. I'll drop the link here quickly in chat. So I think the main reason they wanted to publish this was they said it's novel because it's the first um, full hidden number problem based attack on TLS uh, Diffie Hellman. So that's why they kind of put it out. Um, but they do say, you know, directly in their page that it's not really a practical attack. It's probably not really going to be used in the real world. There's many easier ways to, um, you know, attack a target than abusing something like yeah, this. Yeah, it's novel and it's interesting. It's not... Like, I do think there might be some ways to make it a little bit more practical. Like, I was just talking about using this uh, HTTP2 idea, if we could apply that to TLS. But that's still not going to solve a lot of the issues. 
And just to be clear here, this does require key reuse because you are... So key reuse does happen, of course, but um, a lot of places will use... Uh, if you, like they'll use TLS with uh, Diffie Hellman, they're trying to do the ephemeral keys, wanting forward secrecy. If you reuse the ephemeral key, which is a requirement in this case, if you want to break the ephemeral key, um, you'd have to reuse it. You no longer have forward secrecy, so most setups aren't even going to be vulnerable to it in the first place. Uh, yeah, they do mention like a, a a certain configuration is needed to even make this an issue. Yeah, so. specifically you need that key reuse because you start asking questions about the key. So you can't do that if or won't be doing that calculation again with the same values most of the time or under a lot of normal configurations. It's just some configurations that will do that. I mean, I do think it's an interesting timing attack, like the trimming of the zeros there. Um but yeah, like it's not the most practical thing. It's not internet breaking. Yeah. And I think they talked about why they called it raccoon. And it was basically just because. They just like uh, raccoons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is a great reason to name a vulnerability. I can get behind that. Yeah, not coming up with ridiculous acronyms to make your name work. Which we see yeah. with some white papers. Um, thank you for the Twitch Prime, by the way. Uh, Alkis. I uh, wanted to share that out. So... So getting into some thoughts, uh, so, oh, there was actually one other thing I wanted to point out. Um, they do point out this attack doesn't work on TLS 1.3 because the zero bytes are preserved. Um, so this is for TLS 1.2 and lower, uh, from what I could see. Um, and they do also mention, you know, needing that high level of access to be able to make the timing measurements. So one thing I like about this is, unlike with a lot of named vulns, this one is very open about how exploitable it is, or rather how unlikely to be exploited it is um and i think it deserves some points for that because it seems like a lot of the named attacks we cover they kind of hide that those details away in the white paper they don't have it like right on the you know front page and in the faq you know uh so i think that's really cool uh, that they did that um another interesting point that they make here is that ssl3 was supposed to implement um pkcs3 which means the leading zero bit should have been preserved but the authors of the paper point out that the specification was misunderstood. So those zero bytes were stripped in the implementation, which does leave me a little bit confused. I am going a little bit into the technical details. I'm just kind of wondering if you could clear this up for me, Z. Because um, the white paper at first seemed to indicate the zero byte stripping was intentional to keep the uh, variable length secrets. Um, but near the end, they kind of state this thing with SSL3 that makes it sound like an implementation bug. So... Well, so SSL3 and TLS are different. So in TLS, it's part of the specification, and SSL3, it wasn't. Okay, I see. Okay, I was a little bit confused because they kind of mentioned those two different points, and I was trying to put them together in my head for some reason, but it just didn't click, and that's why. So, yeah, I just wanted to clear that up for myself, really. Um, overall, though, you know, interesting paper. Um, I didn't fully understand it because I'm not into the crypto and math and stuff. You know, I'm not smart enough for that, but... Uh, for those who are, you know, the white paper is probably going to be an interesting read for you. And I even learned some things in there, too. So, going back to NVIDIA, more NVIDIA, uh, we have vulnerabilities in GeForce Now. So, for those who don't know about GeForce Now, it's it's basically a cloud gaming service launched by NVIDIA. I think it was launched near the beginning of the year. Uh, they mentioned uh, January or February or somewhere around there. Um, cloud gaming is picking up popularity because you can use it to play games from anywhere. Right. Um, all the calculations and hardware intensive stuff are being done on the server side. It's also pretty attractive for game developers. Uh, it makes piracy a lot harder to pull off because you don't actually have the game running on your system. It's running on the server and you're just streaming the you know video contents and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, there are some problems with it. Like there's like input lag and stuff like that that's trying to get addressed. But GeForce now is kind of it seemed to be kind of the winner in the hype train around cloud gaming. Um, so you mean as Stadia it... didn't take off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stadia kind of lost, I think. So, you know, as this picked up popularity, the desire to break it from a security standpoint also became more attractive, obviously. Um, so the authors of this blog post kind of note a little bit about how GeForce works. And uh, they note, if you can enter a game that can be launched in windowed mode or try to access a game that's not in the catalog, 
you can access the Steam library of the uh, of the VM. Now they point out if you have a bug in a supported game, like say a Source Engine bug that you can hit in CS:GO or TF2 or something like that, um, that you can hit over the network, you can actually use that to get code execution inside of the VM, which yeah, could be which, fun to do. Which is more or less what you'd expect. What I thought was fun about this particular post, though, is this kind of goes back to kiosk breakouts. Because that's effectively what uh, GeForce Now is. It's a kiosk. Yep. You're supposed to be locked into just the one UI, and if you could break out of that, suddenly you've more or less got access to... I mean, not everything. You're on a restricted user account, but that's generally what they talk about. It's just breaking out, out to Windows, out to a command shell. Um, just, get, like I said, calls back to those older kiosk breakouts, and I don't, I don't know about you, I haven't... I don't see kiosks around as much anymore, at least not this sort of kiosk. Uh, well, not gaming, but like that, that sort of kiosk that you'd have any interest of breaking out of. Um, I can't think of the last time I've even really seen one besides maybe like a hotel, but that's a little bit different too. Yeah, they're, they're kind of disappearing. I mean, I, I, I think I remember some like PS3 kiosk breakouts that were kind of picking up. Uh, you know, seeing some methods on YouTube and stuff like there was the key, co the the button combinations and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think in recent years, I haven't really heard much about them. They they kind of died out in popularity, I guess. Um, but yeah, like you could use that code execution strategy I was mentioning with uh, hitting a game. But the easier way is to just add a non-Steam game. You can add a program that's installed on the machine, like 7-Zip, and modify the program settings to point the path to command prompt to get that shell that you were talking about. Um, now, they do talk about some of the specifics of how they implement the VM, and uh, there are some props to NVIDIA here. They actually do some smart things. They, act, they have a whitelist of applications, and if your application is not in the whitelist, it's it'll crash the VM. It just straight up shuts down. So if you try to launch like PowerShell or any executable that you uh, try to plant on the system, you know, it's it's not going to really, it's not going to run. It's just going to crash. Um, they kind of talk about how they got around that. They basically use DLL hijacking. Um, you know, they, they used, I think, CS source and they basically downloaded what appeared to the game to be a model file, but was actually a DLL and then used the command prompt to move the DLL um, yeah, some of into the... the binary folder. Some of the comments I was seeing indicated that that basically wasn't necessary at all, that the machines have curl on them, uh, which is a little oh, bit surprising okay. being Windows, but not unheard of. Uh, that they well, have curl that you can just download the DLL. Well, you do the same thing to inject it, uh, but oh, okay. apparently like they have curl on them um, accessible. I can't confirm that. They don't mention this. That was just in some of the comments that I saw about it. Uh, so it is worth knowing that they might not have needed to use Counter-Strike source to download files. Uh, okay. But that is kind of a little bit more of a living off the land trick. Using Counter-Strike source to download the files rather than using curl, which would be a little bit easier to monitor for. Yeah. So uh, but yeah, they broke out of the VM, which that's about all they did. They didn't escalate or anything like that. No, um... So it's it's a pretty straightforward attack. It would have been like really cool if they uh, you know got userland execution in the VM and then got a kernel exploit and then uh, a VM escape. But obviously that would have been a very complex chain, a very expensive chain, and uh, probably not something they could really talk about so openly. And um, I mean, is a host this like a guest the host escape? Is somebody going to drop a guest the host O'Day? on the gaming vm i i'm less certain about that it probably I mean, wouldn't could, be worth it i could see the breakout being done for something like mining it's just i don't see a lot of at least right now i can't imagine there's a lot of really sensitive information that you might want to break out or you need persistence on uh so i don't see that as being like a really valuable area to target although I mean, that that's no reason why it's like, oh, therefore, let's not uh, worry about it or let's not worry about security, obviously. But um, I don't know. It's just I don't think a VM escape is necessarily going to be a big threat here. 
Yeah. I mean, I imagine they, I don't think they outright state what they use for virtualization, but given that it's running Windows and it's running games, it's probably using Hyper-V. And like for Hyper-V exploits, I'm pretty sure Microsoft is still paying out like $200,000. So you could use it to break out of an NVIDIA uh, VM and potentially burn an ODA to run mining, or you can just sell it to Microsoft. <laughs> you know, when you're weighing them up on your hands, the Microsoft one probably wins out. Um, that is one area where Microsoft was like super smart was offering such uh, such grand payouts for Hyper-V stuff. So yeah, they yeah offer, I think you're right. I want to say they offer some like 200 or like 250,000 last time I looked for Hyper-V escape, assuming that's what's being run here, which I think is a pretty reasonable assumption given, like you said, it's Windows. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, they're going to pay that. Although I guess you could also use this mine on a ton of GeForce VMs and report it to Windows. I mean, go <laughs> both dip. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it does seem like uh, this issue specifically was fixed with the DLL hijacking. They don't say exactly how they fixed the bug. I imagine they probably just protected the binary folders or something so that you can't just write into them. I, I'm not sure. That would pro that would make the most sense. Um, but that means there is still the possibility of RCEing yourself essentially inside the VM to get user land code execution. So that's still a viable attack strategy. Yeah, yeah, I think the game, like finding an exploit in a game is actually kind of a viable and this would be a use for those sorts of in-game exploits. Yeah. And uh, for what it's worth, you know, that is also why Valve pays out quite a bit for source engine bugs as well. They pay like on their hacker one, I think they paid like 10 to 15 K for bugs like that. So, you know, for those interested in bounty hunting and looking for a target, those games might be an interesting target for you. Um, but yeah, overall pretty straightforward attack, but you know, kind of a cool kind of calls back to those kiosk type escapes. Like you were talking about earlier. I was, I was thinking kind of the same thing when I was reading through it. So speaking of hacker one, we'll get into some uh, hacker one bounties, cash poisoning. Uh, we're revisiting an old favorite of the podcast, uh, that we had before the break. Cause I think we talked about cash poisoning quite a bit before that too. Um, so yeah, this hits uh, been, Shopify. Been one of the hot vulnerabilities this year. Yeah. I mean, as an attack, I think it's kind of cool, but at the same time, it's not extremely difficult to comprehend what's going on. Um, like this attack is straight up. You just run a uh, loop request with forwarded host to a malicious site. And then eventually, you know, after I think they said like 20 to 30 minutes, sometimes um, later requests will use the same forwarded host due to caching. Um, so you can use that to poison links like the Facebook share button and stuff like that. Yeah, the um, whole goal here is, or the whole point um, is you keep making the request until the cache expires. So then you're the first request going in after the cache expires. So it uses your request against the actual server to have the cache response. It just lets them basically change the host name for any of the base links. Uh, so they... Uh, well, the, in the report, they say, like, your hackers site dot com, but um, in the actual images, which don't Did seem to be loading now, but um, in the actual images, they have, like, the burp collaborator uh, URL there. But, I mean, it like I said, straightforward issue. They're basically just saved to replace the URLs. They did say they want to try doing cross-site scripting, and I do notice that this does have um, improper neutralization of HTTP headers for a scripting syntax as the weakness. Which is an interesting thing. I don't reading the comments, it doesn't sound like they actually went and tried cross-site scripting. But that might have been an interesting attack vector for you know, cross-site scripting through a compromised header, which is usually going to be pretty difficult to actually exploit. Because that's like a self self XSS. And it's something like you can't just pass a link to the self XSS when it's a header. Uh, that said, it's unclear if they were actually able to do that. Oh. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the the submitter, like the bounty author, said that they did want to try it, but they didn't. Since this was a cash poisoning attack and was a, could affect other users, they didn't want to potentially yeah, the, step on the toes of Shopify. Yeah, they wanted to keep it within the rules of the testing. They were already kind of edging that line a bit. Um, actually, yeah. it is worth noting that this wasn't in their, it doesn't fall under the cat, any of their eligible vulnerability type categories. They do mention that, but then, then they do say that this ability is, you know, enough to merit an exception. 
uh, which is where they got the thousand dollar bounty out effect. Yeah. And one other thing I will say is one thing I always love doing with the Hacker One reports is looking at like the timelines. And um, this was like addressed super quick. It was reported September 9th, fixed September 10th, and disclosed September 11th. Yeah, so Shopify is like... Shopify's really on top of a lot of them. I see a lot of their reports come up. I don't tend to choose them to cover because they're not necessarily that interesting. But I did like this yeah. one. Um, I will also mention uh, out of chat there, it's comment there this is nuts that somebody did not find this before i'm not uh, sure if that's related to what we're talking about or what they linked because they linked the worm of a window server vuln uh, oh okay was just uh released today so we don't have any details on that so i don't think we could really cover that okay yeah no comment then i was just going to say something like this i feel like could easily pass by because you like exported host usually that's a header being added by like your reverse proxy and should be stripped coming in uh so it is a bit of a miss setup but it's definitely not an unheard of test case it's just a less common test case i'd say yeah um either way if that's not his point though so i don't need to comment on it too much regarding the link uh we will probably cover that next week because uh Obviously, you know, I don't want to, you know, pause the stream for like five minutes or whatever to read into that bug as much as it would be nice to cover it uh, in this episode. So, yeah, we'll probably cover that next week. Um, related to this, though, while it is a straightforward issue, I do have kind of a question. Um, I don't know if you'd be able to, or if this is like a stupid question or anything, but like, how do you balance between, because you were saying like you have to get the first request in when the cache expires. How do you balance between trying to pull off this attack and trying not to like DDoS the site or getting added to like IP tables for, you know, sending too many requests too fast? Because I imagine you probably have to send quite a few requests to make sure that you're the first request in the new cache, right? At least for testing? Oh, you don't. You could just choose a page that isn't going to be super popular. Okay. Which Fair they enough. even mention um, that they'd have liked to, you know, use... Uh less popular page or something that's a generally i just wouldn't go more than a request a second okay that is just something that i was kind of thinking of while you were talking about it It was like that is kind of an interesting balance to strike and i haven't really seen much talking about that so yeah and because of i'm not sure or i don't recall offhand exactly what shopify's policy is when it comes to denial of service type issues Uh, but uh, the biggest concern is going to be, one is the fact that this will impact live users. It'll impact anybody that's going to visit it. So that's where it could have been kind of off of their official policy. Yeah. Um, and of course, just denial of service, which again, kind of impacts users. So it could be against the policy. Uh, so being aware of the policy, being aware of the terms, kind of lets you know what you can and can't do. Um, when I would be on an engagement, if there was some that I'm like, this looks really weird, but I can't test it because I think I might cause a problem. I would general, I have a point of contact that I would just get permission to test or they just say no. And I'd know that, and this wasn't test for whatever reason, but it would just be an observation. Yeah. Uh, but for bug bounties, you just have to follow what it is. You can maybe ask through hacker one, but generally speaking, you're expected just to follow it. Yeah, there's not as much uh, leeway. Yeah. So our next hacker one report is uh, a team object in GraphQL disclosed private comment. So this one is another uh, pretty straightforward issue uh, that affects hacker one directly. Um, it basically just seems to be an exposed GraphQL endpoint with no authorization on it. So well, not so much no auth on it. Because I mean, the GraphQL API is their API for querying like hacker one data. It's it's their API. They can't just not expose it, then they wouldn't have the API. I believe the website uses it too. Um, I might be mistaken about that, but it's their API, so it's not like they can't expose it. The issue here, though, is that kind of as you make some of the subqueries with GraphQL, uh, one of them here ends up, one of the nodes ends up including private comments. Um, and I mostly just want to point this one out because it's GraphQL is one of those areas that it's really rich for these sorts of information disclosure issues. 
where some piece of information might not be included in like the public type that you're able to query, but you might be able to get access to it through like a sub. Well, I, I think GraphQL uses another term besides sub query, but uh, through what I would refer to as like a sub query, uh, uh, accessing like a deeper object that then exposes that it's not using the more restricted type, I guess. Uh, so I just want to kind of call this out more as something to keep an eye on because I've seen a lot of issues dealing with GraphQL. Actually, specifically HackerOne has had a number of similar issues come up where information is being exposed where it maybe shouldn't be. Um, in this case, they did call it, um, they're able to see private comments and they called it confidentiality high as the rating on it. HackerOne put it down to medium, I believe. Uh, but so, still paid out a $2,500 bounty on it. So what I kind of wanted to ask was looking at the report and like the URLs in the uh, initial report, it, it mentions like survey rating items or something like that. I wasn't really sure exactly. Like, it, Were they hitting reports? Were they getting report private comments or was it something else? Because it, like these survey rating items, I'm not sure what exactly that I couldn't means. tell you offhand. It's whatever the survey rating item is in their GraphQL API. Like, that's just the type. Well, it's okay. the thing being queried. So that's like, you can think of it kind of like a table. Um, so exactly what that is. Um, it wasn't I, super I don't, clear. Well, they just don't go into it. I mean, it's not exactly relevant. Like, it's not like you need to go to that page or something. That just happens to be the endpoint. We can probably pull it up here. Um, well, what it would have been nice for me was trying to see, like, the, you know, the impact of it. Like, if it's private comments on bounty reports, I can see that being, like, pretty serious. But if it's on something else, that being said, I don't know what that something else would be. So, <laughs> but if it's on something that's not, like, bounty reports, and I could see it being, you know, less serious. So yeah, that's well, why they mentioned that, that they kind of take it high because it could include personal information. Yeah. I just feel like I wouldn't call something... Um, a high rating unless it exposed like a lot of information like <laughs> um i mean so you can like obviously if it just exposes uh you know seven digits of a social insurance number social security number you know that that could still be a high i'm not saying it's like flat out with, like lots of information high like use your head but Oh, no, I, I would generally, like, if I had some that just exposes the one field there, like, I wouldn't call this high. Hacker one also didn't. Um, and they actually called it low, not medium. Um, I yeah. mean, it could include private information, but it doesn't necessarily do so. So looking through the comments, I found something that was kind of interesting. I noticed uh, he reported the issue and then Hacker one was like, OK, we think we fixed it. Would you mind retesting this? Uh, and when he did, and he confirmed that the issue was fixed, they paid him uh, a fifty dollar bounty in advance just for testing their fixed deployment. And we've we've covered a lot of Hacker One reports before, and I don't remember ever seeing that. I think that's kind of cool that they're you know giving a little bit of extra money for um, working with them and testing their fixes. That yeah, way they don't have to do it themselves. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, I didn't even notice that, but I think this is also the first time we've covered a Hacker One Hacker One report. No, I think we've covered them before. I, I do remember talking about Hacker One, Hacker One reports. Okay, perhaps yeah. I don't remember it, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, but uh, I just wanted to call that out. I thought that was kind of cool. You know, maybe that's something that uh, that Hacker One has been doing for a while, and it's just you know, obviously we haven't been covering any bounty reports in the last like five months because we haven't been doing the podcast. So, you know, it's probably just the first time I'm seeing it, but still, thought it was cool. So, moving away from Hacker One, we have. Google Maps, um, a ten thousand dollar bounty in Google Maps, and it's uh, it was an XSS. So this person submitted an XSS uh, to Google. It had been fixed, but then something had prompted him to look back at it and see if the fix was actually adequate. And uh, judging by the fact that there's a full blog post about this, you can probably guess that it wasn't. Well, Google um, did ask him to do the retest. Like it, it was prompted by Google saying, you know, they fixed that, awarded it. Um, if I. I guess I don't see it. Yeah, feel free to check and let us know if it looks okay. Um, so the second one was kind or half prompted by that rather than just going back to look at it. Well, 
he did say up above that he was uh, just kind of bored, and uh, that's why he kind of looked back at it. So that's where that's where I was uh, basing that off of. But anyway, fair yeah, fair enough. Um, so it's in the future that feature that allows you to create your own maps, which are described using KML, which is uh, an XML like format. So you send uh, Google KML and you get an XML response with some KML tags in there. Um, so the initial XSS used special characters to close the C data tag and to escape out of it to inject arbitrary XML. So this granted him the 5K bounty and the, the initial fixed message. Uh, but when he tried it again, uh, he noticed that the script that they uh, tried to inject was encapsulated in another C data tag. So, you know, instead of just one C data tag, there was now two. So, if I so can the author just tried using multiple in. tags to uh, to accommodate for that. Go ahead. Sir, yeah, if I can jump in. So the issue here is in the export as KML. Um, KML, like the format, the XML is KML. That is the format. Um, this is not, like it is kind of the map builder, but you're not importing anything in there. Um, this is just like if you go on the Google website, you can create a map. You can set the name of it. Um, and the name is what was vulnerable here so it's actually almost like it feels a little bit like a classic cross-site scripting where it's like you have the name and you inject a script into it and you get cross-site scripting um in particular it does put it around seek data so it does prevent it from being executed um using the normal c data tags there uh and that the first one was just okay so you close the c data tag as part of your cross-site scripting injection and you get cross-site scripting uh, so that was the first part of it. That was the first thing that got fixed was, you know, a very traditional exploit style there. Now, there are some things that made this a little bit different. I'm not going to dive into it, but this is a page that has content type text slash XML. It also has uh, content type options, no sniff, and content disposition attachment. Um, all of which kind of make actually exploiting a cross-site scripting a little bit more difficult. They use... Uh, as a uh, fairly straightforward SVG payload. Um, they don't talk completely about the attack scenario, uh, which might just be because Google didn't require it, but it is worth noting that there are uh, those things in there that mitigate the impact of it already. Uh, but otherwise, like it has that feel of a very easy cross-site scripting, especially for Google uh, to just be able to inject uh, break out of the C data by closing the tag. Like that's seems kind of simple for a Google XSS. Yeah, they paid him five thousand for the first one. The fix, though, was Spectre was just about to get into, was basically if they detected that you tried to close the C data tag, they would just inject another C data tag, like start block, to match that one, the end block that you injected. Um, the problem with that is if you inject a second closing tag they wouldn't open that one so you can do the exact same thing again um just by closing and closing the one that they inject to prevent you from closing it in the first place um unfortunately their next fix was not vulnerable in the same way couldn't get fifteen thousand. had they cap it at them yeah they, they didn't just inject it was obviously this was a fix it it almost seems a little bit stupid that like a Google <laughs> engineer would do that fix. It clearly seems to be a fix that they just didn't understand what the root of the issue was. Um, and so they fixed the obvious thing, like the specific case, without kind of getting the core of the issue. Which I thought was really interesting, but I also just found it interesting because this, on the surface, is a really simple vulnerability. And, I mean, it is. Like, it's straightforward to understand. It's nothing too crazy. But, obviously, people have overlooked this for quite a while. Unless code recently changed, which is a possibility. But it seems to me like there's a good chance that people just overlook this as an area to even attack. And that's so much of what bug bounties tend to find are a lot of those issues that are being overlooked by everybody else. Being overlooked by the masses. Yeah. So one thing I will point out is from the uh, screenshot of the email that he has there is this issue was from last year. Uh, the date on the email is Friday, June 7th, 2019. So this isn't like, a, you know, something that 
was an issue like a few months ago. It's just he's just talking about it now. Um, so, but I think this is another showcase of, you know, don't always assume that a bug was fixed correctly just because it's a company like Google that fixed it. Um, I think there that is like a common misconception is, okay, this bug is fixed. Okay, I'll move on and look at something else. You know, it's it's easy to assume, you know, this company is Google or this this is Linux or whatever. Like they know how to fix issues. It's dead, whatever, right? Um, and this is just a, you know, kind of case in point example of that's not always the case. So out of chat, um, I'm going to read that name as Paul Riddle, but I'm not sure how to pronounce the one there instead of an L. Uh, that's why you shouldn't give fixed suggestions with vulnerability reports, so that there's a chance you can score again on their misunderstanding. Fair point. I'm not Kinda sure. I, <laughs> I'm not sure I uh, morally agree with that one, but at the same time, I do think a lot, kind of frequently, people overstep the bounds of making that report and then being like, and here's how you fix it and doing this. And they overstep kind of what they should be saying there because I have no idea what language Google is using there. I don't know anything about the inter internal architecture, about how things are getting parsed and passed around or anything like that. So at best, like the remediation is, you know, basically filtering, sanitizing, or validating the information that's coming in. It's a really high level thing. Um, and even if this person would have made that suggestion, this vulnerability still could have happened the second time. Like the bad fix still could have been put in place. Uh, because I mean, without knowing the internal details, you can't be specific enough uh, to have prevented that. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a fair point to me. If you're trying to maximize the money you make off of bounties, I guess that's fair. I mean, my background is, you know, doing the assessments professionally, not not as a bounty. So I wasn't being paid, you know, per finding. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's based on personal preference, right? Like, obviously, companies do really appreciate higher quality reports. At the same time, if they're not paying you for the higher quality reports, I could definitely see how if you if you didn't want to be super generous that you could withhold that information to, you know, hold out hope that you could still uh, get another bounty on top of that. Um, yeah, like with bug bounties, they're asking for the bugs. They're paying you for the bugs. Like, I think it's fair to not include um, the vulnerability information. I just, I wouldn't include that because I don't think it's my place necessarily to report that beyond just like a high level. Here's the issue. Here's kind of the general idea about a fix. Um, but having that theory behind it about, well, maybe I can get more money. Uh, because you can take that a little bit further, suggest a fix that sounds right but isn't. <laughs> now that I think is uh, over the moral line. <laughs> That's a little bit uh, mischievous. Um, but yeah, th that is one area I will say Microsoft, with their the way they do bounties, is kind of smart. Uh, with you know doing the paying based on the report quality as as well as you know not just the bug right also based on the report quality that is one area where i think that could address those kinds of uh concerns um you'll notice i am i've been kind of praising microsoft's bug bounty i'm kind of you know building them up tear them down i guess because we will be talking about microsoft in a bit of a uh not so positive light a little bit later on so don't worry we're not giving a, a one-sided take here we just haven't gotten there yet so speaking of microsoft we're, we will talk about their SharePoint and Exchange server vulnerabilities. Uh, there was a little bit of drama around this as well. So just before we jump there, actually, sorry, um, yep. out of chat, had a follow up question. Would it be legal to introduce a vulnerability in open source components like Rails and wait until a company updates and report it? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I don't believe so. Um, my logic on that or my thought on that comes to the fact that i believe that has been done in the past um and you might be able to get the bounty payout but then you face the criminal charges for the sabotage that's what um, i was thinking where there's probably like, you could probably get got on the injection of the bug yeah i feel like there this has been done before i just can't think of the actual case i know i've looked into had that idea before 
Um, and I'm sure it was in response to like an actual case. Unfortunately, I can't recall it offhand. But I would want to say in most countries, no, you can't sabotage a program to claim a bounty on finding the same issue. Uh, that said, I mean, you do kind of get the line where what if you, let's say you're a Linux kernel maintainer. Um, and let's say, you know, the Linux kernel offered a bounty on the bugs. What if you accidentally introduce a case or claiming money for all the bugs that you introduce into the Linux kernel? And I think, like, intent kind of matters there. And I don't know how far that goes in terms of the law. Um, yeah, this, there's an interesting discussion to be had there, for sure. Yeah, one place that this discussion has come up, actually, in a really related way, is in some programming communities. Might even be a Stack Overflow post, uh, which talks about, you know, getting paid uh, by the number of ticks, tickets you resolve. And so if you create more tickets and cause more tickets, you can also get paid more. And it, I don't know, I've, I've seen a similar discussion in programming communities. So if you want to dig into it, that might be another area to kind of look at because it's similar. You're introducing problems to get paid more. So I will say, I don't think it was confirmed that it was actually a uh, vulnerability injection. But what I'm kind of reminded by in this discussion was a, uh, a free BSD kernel bug that um Cturt actually talked about in one of his articles um I, I forget all the technical details of it but it was basically a signness issue an integer signness issue and the bug wasn't originally there but somebody went in in a commit and had actually changed the cast on the integer from like unsigned to signed or something to introduce a signness issue and it was a really suspicious code change because there didn't really seem to be a reason to do that other than to, you know, introduce a problem. Like, it didn't really add any benefit to the code. Yeah, didn't so we it talk does kind of remind it? me of that. Uh, I think we might have talked about it privately. We didn't, I don't think we talked about it on the podcast because it was before we even started the podcast. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, like, that. that's kind of one thing I'm reminded of that was, uh, that I thought, you know, might have been, like, uh, that case of vulnerability injection. And you can bet, you know, organizations like the NSA and stuff have, you know, plants and companies and are probably injecting vulnerabilities and stuff like that. I, I could definitely see it. It would make a lot of sense for them to do stuff like that. So I, I have no doubt that it's happening. I don't know if people are doing it for bounties. It might, you know, but I, I have no doubt that there's bug, bug injection happening, even if we don't see uh, exact proof of it happening, you know? Yeah, so I guess maybe a, it would be harder to catch you on this one would be if you injected a vulnerability into something and then uh, sold the exploit for it. That would be a lot harder to catch than trying to claim a bounty on something. Yeah, And sure. possibly a little bit more... A little bit more gray. More dubious, yeah. Uh, that being said, though, I think we'll we'll move on to some Microsoft stuff. Uh, unless you... Do you have anything more to add on that... Uh... No, I that think little we've, side discussion? I think we've hit it. Okay. So, CVEs and uh, SharePoint and Exchange Server. So, we don't have many technical details on these vulnerabilities. They're basically just the Microsoft advisories on them. Um, but three vulnerabilities were reported across uh, SharePoint and Exchange Server. Um, two of them were listed as tampering vulnerabilities in SharePoint, uh, which fails to properly handle profile data. Um, an attacker who successfully exploits this vulnerability could modify a target's user profile data. It does require authentication on the server. And then the third CVE is a little bit more serious. It's the uh, it's a remote code execution in the Exchange server due to improper validation of command let packet uh, arguments. So that one also needs an authenticated user in a certain Exchange role, um, but it is a privilege escalation because it does get you to system. So. Uh, while we don't have too many technical details, I did want to talk about this because the person who submitted these uh, bugs feels like Microsoft is trying to downplay the bugs and their advisories. Um, they claim the first two CV CVEs were not just tampering vulnerabilities like Microsoft mentions, but they were actually powerful uh, server-side request forgeries. So obviously, without the technical details, I don't think we could really side with one or the other on there. Um, and I the third say... CVE... 
Tampering yep. does kind of... It seems to be a weird choice when it comes to a server-side request forgery issue. Like, I don't know, tampering? Like, okay, if it's... Maybe the attack scenario is that they're able to use this tamp... Or, sorry, able to use the server-side request forgery. Um, and they use that to modify, you know, some property or to tamper with some other data hitting some internal endpoint or something. That I can maybe see why they'd call it tampering. Uh, it just it doesn't feel like SSRF usually falls under tampering, because uh, that's like that's a stride type. And at the same time, why call it tampering? Like RCE, they in uh, the third report, um, you know, they say it's a remote code execution vulnerability versus a tampering vulnerability. So it's not like they're only restricting themselves to using the stride types. Because RC is not a stride type, tampering is. Uh, but RC is not. So it's not like they're restricting its vulnerability. So it seems really weird that Microsoft did that. Um, and it's also worth noting that the first two reports here um, actually have... Um, there we go. Uh, these two reports here, I guess nobody can really see, but... You can see the CV number changes, but nothing else changes. The reports are exactly the same in terms yep. of their description for the two. Uh, they're both just tampering with exactly the same description, which actually makes me think that this could have been somewhat innocuous as just being um, like maybe there's another CV reported around the same time. They just copy and pasted the wrong description into it and not actually try and downplay because tampering does seem weird. I was going to say, like, it seems like a weird term to use. Well, temp, like, it's a fair term to use when you have something that's actually resulting in you being able to modify, like, configuration settings or something like that, uh, where you're tampering with data that already exists. Like, that makes sense. SSRF, it's hard to say where you fit that in. It's kind of a repudiation issue, in a sense, because you're causing a request to be created that isn't actually originating by the server you're forging the server's request it's kind of repudiation which is a stride type um but you'd have to take into account you know what you're actually doing to get any further than that i think uh but they do mention here in the twitter thread i believe that the description itself just seemed completely wrong that's why i'm thinking there's a chance that it could be unrelated like, it could just be a description accidentally pasted in. Yeah. And it's worth noting that third CVE that was listed as a remote code execution was originally marked as a memory corruption until uh, Microsoft updated it, which does make me question, like what you were saying, where it might just be a copy and paste issue or something. If they updated the the memory corruption to RCE on CVE 2021-6875, it does seem weird that they wouldn't also update the other issues that he complained about. So, yeah, kind of kind of weird around that. Um, the author did say the advisories uh, will be published with proof of concepts later on down the line in like a couple of weeks. So maybe when those come out, we can address it again um, and kind of circle back to it and see if the labeling of SSRF should have been applied there. So you know, I can't imagine it shouldn't revisit. have, to be honest, like. That's a hard vulnerability to miscategorize. Like, oh, it's not actually SRF, it's what else would it be? Like, if you're causing the request to be made, um, like that, I don't know how you could miscategorize that one, but I, I get what you mean. Yeah. So I got two points of discussion out of this that I kind of wanted to bring up. The first one is, do you think it's fair to label a bug that has been proven to be able to be leveraged for RCE to be labeled as just a memory corruption? Like, obviously, in this case, Microsoft did change it. But I think I've seen cases in the past where things that have been proven to be RCE-able, they just mention as a memory corruption to kind of downplay it a little bit. Technically, it is correct because you're getting RCE through a memory corruption. So do you think it's fair for them to maybe be a little bit vague on that or do you think they should say outright that it is an rce if it's demonstrated to be possible i think it would be better if they kept to the stride types elevation of privilege or escalation of privilege um, okay if they just said that and then included details like hey this is a memory corruption leading to code execution or not leading to it um but 
I don't know, it's a remote code execution vulnerability. Just it's not as telling as it's an elevation of privilege vulnerability. And then later on, an attacker who successfully exploits this could run code and you know run arbitrary code. That I think gives the proper information. It just seems like asking the question about, you know, should they call it RC or memory corruption? They're describing like they should be used in different areas. They're describing different things. Like they're describing the same thing, but yeah, I just I don't think using a remote code execution vulnerability or a memory corruption vulnerability is really is, is really that useful of a statement without the rest of it like being more in a description. If that makes sense. I guess yeah. Usually when you're talking about memory corruption, it's either going to be a DOS if it can't be exploited, or it's going to be code execution if it can be. So which if it's code execution, it's elevation of privilege. If it's a DOS, it's a denial of service. Again, those are yeah, both, you exactly. know, the Stride types. Like, oh no, Microsoft, I believe, like, Stride is a Microsoft thing. I believe it was invented in Microsoft, too. So, I just think they could use it. <laughs> Would make sense. That said, I mean, it might be old. Maybe they've got something else, and I'm just not aware of it. But I feel like in that first statement, it would make more sense to just stick to the Stride. And then, in their later statement, an attacker who exploits that can do x y or z that's where they can share more information arbitrary code corruption denial of service i yeah actually i wouldn't even call it memory corruption really i just would drop that they could run code they can information disclosure out of it again another stride type thing um yeah okay so the other discussion i wanted to kind of segue into talking about was the complaints around the ms bounty stuff uh recently it's been brought up in our discord uh quite a few times i want to say like two or three times and i've seen it talked about in other discords i'm in as well um so there was some drama while we were on break about uh, microsoft not paying out for submitted bounty uh submitted vulnerabilities so we kind of talked a little bit about this in the re server and like text chat uh when it happened though this was like right as it happened we didn't have uh, some of the details we have now but basically, uh, this guy named Jonathan, uh, sorry, Jonas Lick uh, found a bunch of vulnerabilities in Microsoft products and reported them. Um, and he hadn't been paid out in over seven months, according to him. So some of the issues that he stated he found was like privilege escalation and diagnostic tracking, group policy service, Hyper-V file cache poisoning, lock screen bypasses, BitLocker encryption breaking, like some serious issues. And um, we were discussing at the time that it is probably not the best idea to base your livelihood and uh, like whether you're going to be able to pay your bills and stuff like that on bug bounties because um, they are kind of unreliable by nature. But at the same time, it seems super weird that a reputable company like Microsoft wasn't paying him and the issues seem to be legit. Like his, he was kind of being corroborated by some other like high up people in InfoSec, uh, people that I like really respect. So it doesn't seem like it's just some you know, kid who's trying to, you know, get a Twitter outrage mob against Microsoft. It did seem like he had legitimate issues. And um, he's actually posted some technical details in Google Docs about some of the issues he's found, um, which there's far too many to cover here on the podcast. So we're, we're not going to do that. But those interested can go to his timeline and follow the links and, and see the technical details if you're interested. But it seemed after he threatened to post all the information publicly, if he didn't get paid out, um, it seems the next day that he did get paid out because uh, Microsoft approved like 40k of Hacker One submissions, and he stopped tweeting about Microsoft not paying. So, it, it, seven months is a long time to not get paid for a bounty. I mean, typically when we're talking about bounties, we're talking about like 90 day disclosure deadlines. It's three months. We're talking about seven months before he was even paid. That does seem kind of. Uh, kind of like an indictment against microsoft here like that's really surprising we don't um, know that he actually got paid it's another thing we don't know for certain he didn't say but judging by the context i think it's fair to assume he did i don't know i mean i almost feel like he would have actually stated that uh that said hmm. i don't know uh, your only base there though is kind of the correlation between the approval of one payment and his silence so it's definitely possible 
Um, Circumstantial you, evidence, as the courts would say. Did you dig into some of these? Because I know when I first saw this, and since this was just a discussion, I didn't dig into further details on it. Uh, have you looked at how these work? Like, are these... My initial assumption was that a lot of these were going to be around that... Uh, like the sim links and directory junctions, which we've talked about a ton on the podcast, uh, and Microsoft decided that they weren't going to pay out on anymore. Oh, is that the case, or are these like more? Are these other issues? So yeah, that is something I kind of wanted to bring up. So our speculation at the time was that they were based on the sim linking stuff, which Microsoft stopped paying for in April, I believe. I think we talked about it on the podcast actually. Um, when I looked into it, I didn't look like deep into every issue. I did glance at some of them. Um, there were a few issues that were based on sim linking stuff, which, um, you know, obviously are ineligible as we know, but there were other issues that didn't seem to be related to the sim linking stuff. They seem to be other issues entirely. So, um, I can't confidently say that all of them were like, I didn't dig into them super deeply, but from what I could tell at a glance, um, not all of them were sim linking stuff. Um, a fair bit of them were different issues. That being said, it's hard to say for sure because I'm not really in the Windows realm. So a lot of these reports are specific to, you know, Windows services and stuff like that. And Windows does do some weird things with how they, you know, manage like the registry and all the internal subsystems they have and stuff like that. So I don't even think I could dig too deeply into them um, and talk about it confidently. So, you know, I could be wrong. I will kind of preface it with that. But from what I could tell, a good deal of them weren't related to just straight up sim link attacks. Yeah. So in that case, like, I feel like we're only getting half the story. Microsoft has some reason that they haven't paid for. I don't think he's actually made it clear the reason Microsoft has given him. And that's somewhat suspicious to me. No, I mean, if maybe it's legitimate, maybe it's not. But at the same time, like, Microsoft isn't known for shafting researchers. No, which is why this was, like, really surprising when it happened. Yeah, that's... So, I mean, I... I don't know, I, I want to give Microsoft a bit of the benefit of the doubt and kind of, I'd want to hear their side before I kind of condemn Microsoft over it. I also don't want to condemn this guy. Like, obviously, he thinks he should be paid. I don't think... There's any question about that. Like, I don't think he's being malicious at all. Like, none of it's really seemed like he's being malicious, just upset. Okay. Do you think Microsoft should have addressed this, like, drama publicly? Or do you think Kill It With Silence was probably a smart move on their part and justified? I have to imagine they generally don't uh, give information about the vulnerabilities like that. That he might be allowed to, but... As far as I know, like, it doesn't seem like Microsoft would generally just comment on such outrage. Um, as no, for but do you what, think they should? I think the better policy is just to stay out. Let their reputation do the speaking. Okay. I mean, I would like to have more information, but, like, thinking about from, like, as a company, is it better for them to always just respond to every allegation of well you didn't pay out my bounty and here's and then they have to go and dig up why i don't know i don't want to feed twitter mobs so while i don't necessarily think jonas here was trying to do that i'm just thinking about that when i'm talking about what i think microsoft should or shouldn't have done yeah and kind of addressing from uh from chat uh with paul saying it i think it's worthwhile to have a significant twitter following if you're an infosec for leverage uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it worthwhile. Look, it, it's worthwhile it, for sure. I don't know if I agree with the fact that like that should be worthwhile, but <laughs> it is worthwhile. I mean, it works. But here's the thing: is like when you're like in, uh, w when you're looking for jobs, right, and you're submitting resumes and stuff like that. Typically, if if you have work, you probably have it linked to a Twitter. And if a company goes to look at your Twitter and they see that you use outrage mobs to try to get your way with companies that's probably not going to look very good on you so while it can be useful to get what you want um you know moral questions aside with that you may want to consider like reconsider doing that bef if you're like planning on looking for jobs in the future i could definitely see companies looking at that and being like 
uh, maybe we'll pass. You know, we just don't want somebody who's willing to do stuff like that. I don't know if, do you think that that's probably a big consideration by like hiring departments and stuff, see? I mean, it can be a consideration. I mean, there's also the other side of it, though. Hey, I agree with you on this. Let me show my support by hiring you. Yeah, I think it's go enough. both ways if people care about the Twitter. If they don't, they don't. Like, not everybody cares to go even check the Twitter. I guess it would vary on a company-by-company company basis, yeah. Yeah, well, definitely even more on, like, a personal basis. Yeah, whoever's doing the hiring, yeah. That being said, though, um, yeah, I just wanted to bring it up because it has been talked a lot about in our Discord and stuff, and, you know, figured might as well address it on the podcast now that we're back. But that being said, we'll we'll move on to some more technical stuff. So, uh, I love kernel exploitation, so uh, I'm pretty happy that we have two topics about them today. Uh, our first one is in the Linux kernel. So, uh, it's in the uh, BPF subsystem, uh, Berkeley Packet Filter. Funnily enough, it has two CVEs uh, for what's kind of the same issue. Um, and it's the use after free in the C group management portion of BPF. So, I'm not going to go too deep into the technical details. Basically, as I understand it, um, they have reference counting. Uh, which will free the C group when that reference count hits one, which is kind of com uh, common kernel, you know, free based on the ref count. It makes it a little bit easier to keep track of uh, objects and try to kill uh, memory leaks. But they also have a path taken that clear cleans up the object when the object is cloned. And there's a bit of confusion on whose responsibility it is to clean up the memory for this object. So that's what seemed to lead to the bug. Um, when the ref count drops and the object is freed, the clone routine uses the dangling pointer on that object. Um, and it seems like there was probably a bit of a race aspect to this as well. Um, it might have been easier to hit before, because the author said uh, they were able to reproduce this issue with 100% success rate at one point, until a patch was added that added some locking in, and now it's only at like a 30% success rate. So, uh, kind of an interesting issue. It was reported in mid-July. Um, the CVE was initially assigned as a null dereference, which is really interesting because this is obviously it's a use after free maybe the null dereference was a side effect of the use after free but it's kind of disingenuous to label it as just a null dereference that's kind of downplaying it right um so the second thing CD... changing it uh like it's downplaying it because you know generally speaking your null pointer dereferences just aren't too exploitable these days but it's also just yeah. like the wrong classification yeah Although it was only, um, or correct me if I'm wrong, but so there was the CV, like there was the Red Hat CV, and then there was the Mitri CV description. I think they were different. That Red Hat, or Red Hat's bug description, uh, had it properly. It was a kernel used after free, and Mitri had it incorrect as the null pointer dereference. Uh, yeah, I want to say you're right. I'm just doing a quick double check. Yeah, Red Hat labels it as a UAF. Um, the Mitre, did they update it? No, it still says uh, a flaw null, a flaw null pointer dereference. Uh, and was found uh, uh, in the way when reboot the system. Whew, wow, yeah, this is very... not written very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that part is actually also worth calling out because, as I understand it. He discovered it when the system was shutting down, but that was not the only way to trigger the issue. I think the issue was just triggered when the uh, when the group was on the detach. Up. Yeah. So that's also downplaying it even further, saying like, if you're rebooting the system and you're stuck in the reboot even when you exploit, that's kind of not incredibly useful because you're not really able to do much when the system is rebooting anyway. So yeah, that CVE by Mitra just seems to be. Uh, I don't know that that's just doesn't seem to be accurate at all so i don't know what happened there um but yeah there was a second cve attached to this um because there was a fix that was backported for the lts kernel but the fix was incorrect uh they actually missed the reference count check in the clone function so uaf was still possible um so there was one thing i kind of wanted to look at with this issue which was with kernel use after freeze one thing I always like to ask is what cache is the object in, because that matters a lot for stability. The smaller the cache, the less stable your exploit's going to be typically, because those caches are used more, there's more noise, more likely your pointer gets stolen from you. 
Um, so I actually, because it's not totally clear in the source, when you're reading the source code, it's really hard to determine the size of kernel objects often because you have inline structures and all that kind of stuff and calculating that in your head just generally isn't fun. So I went to load um, a, the binary of the Linux kernel into you know, this assembler to try to get the size of the allocation. And um, I, I did that like two hours ago and it's still not even loaded. So unfortunately I can't offer the insight I wanted to there, but um, I imagine looking at the object, it is a large object. It's definitely larger than like 64 bytes or 128 and those are the caches when you start getting into more stable territory is when you hit like the 128 and above so it's likely that this uh this exploit was probably pretty stable as well so you know that's kind of interesting to consider because while you while he says that you can only hit at 30 percent success rate i think that just means that they could only trigger it 30 percent of the time it doesn't mean that it crashes the other 70 percent of the time as far as i know so that makes a big difference too right if it's if it's just that it only works 30% of the time, you can just keep hitting it until you get it. So, yeah. Always fun to think about the, uh, speculate about the stability of uh, exploits when reading the technical details. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if he went on to fully exploit it either, like to even try and stabilize it and weaponize it. I don't think he did, which is fair. I mean, you don't really need to. One thing that I did kind of want to call out with this report is... And it's not exactly, it's only somewhat related to the report itself. It's not really related to the vulnerability. But oftentimes I tend to talk about vulnerability discovery uh, in one of two ways. I'll talk about top-down discovery or analysis, where you kind of start looking at the code and you dig deeper and deeper into the code to find your vulnerability, like your static source auditing like that. And then I tend to refer to fuzzing as bottom up uh analysis and i feel like this is a really good example of doing the bottom up analysis now in this case is not fuzzing like this was just going from the crash but that's kind of my point with bottom up you're starting with the crash and then you're working your way back up to find how the vulnerability actually happened from that crash information you're starting at the bottom going higher level uh, so I, I just wanted to point out, like, I think this report is a really good example of that bottom-up analysis, even though it's not from a fuzzing thing, it's still kind of starting from the bottom. It sounded like you were going to say something, Spectre. Yeah, I was just going to say, I kind of want to shout out uh, Live Overflow. He has a video kind of talking about that. Um, I think I think the official terms, or the terms he uses for it at least, are sync to source and source to sync. Um, yeah, so I mean, he talks about it in like a web context, I think, but it can still be applied to binary. And he has a video that goes into like some of the pros and cons of each approach. And uh, I think that is probably like a really interesting video that um, like somebody not familiar with those concepts should probably, you know, give a listen to. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to see source, if I can pull That's it up. the uh, engineering terms for it, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, let me just see. Yeah. So live overflow has a video on it. I, I'll link that in chat. We'll also put it in the YouTube description, but that's a nice little like 10 minute video by live overflow kind of going through, um, each process what's involved and you know, where they might offer benefits. Uh, so moving on to our next kernel topic, FreeBSD. So of course with the, uh, with the PS4 stuff, I, I got linked to this like three or four times. Um, because the PS4 runs a FreeBSD kernel. This does not affect PS4 as far as I know, because it's a, the the issue is in a legacy 32-bit send message implementation. And they message, and they mentioned that it affects FreeBSD kernels since 2014. Uh, the FreeBSD kernel running on the PS4 is earlier than 2014. It's from like 2000, when was FreeBSD 9? I don't even remember, but it's, it's older than 2012, because that's when the PS4 came out, so. To answer those questions right away, you know, we're not talking about it in the context of the PS4. So, the issue itself... Oh, this um, it isn't was, a PS4 exploit stream. This is not a PS4 exploit stream, no. Those those are uh, those are gone. So, uh, talk to. So, this is a time of check, time of use issue in the legacy 32-bit send message implementation. The issue here is they copy in the message header structure, which contains the message length protocol and type. They validate it. And then they copy it in again for actually using it. It's extremely weird. 
Um, it's basically a double fetch. The problem here is the user land data can change between the validation and the recopy. So you can pass in dangerous values post-validation. So this is a really weird bug. Usually in a kernel function, you'll copy in user land data to a controlled buffer, you'll validate it, and then you'll use that validated data, right? That kind of makes sense. In the kernel land, you completely control that buffer. So I, I don't really know why they rely on user land more. Given that this is legacy code, I guess, I don't know. I, I don't even see how like this code could be excused even in a legacy context. Yeah, honestly. like it's not even like saving memory or something. <laughs> no, like I don't know. And this was, this is actually worse for performance too, the way they yeah. do this. Like there's just no rationale behind it that I can see. Um, and it was so weird that we originally thought it was operating on user land data directly, like a typical double fetch. But then we got we got thinking about it, and supervisor mode access prevention would have blocked that. So, yeah, just just a really weird, weird but straightforward vulnerability. Um, now, what, what's cool about this post is they do go into detail about exploiting it uh, by using a heap overflow to trigger a free on an mbuff, which is kind of like a generic container, and then they UAF the uh, the object that has a function table. And uh, so they, they force the free on the mbuff, they hijack the function table to get code execution. So they mentioned some of the steps they took uh, using like a jump oriented chain to get to a ROP chain. And then they mark the user page tables as executable, disable SMAP and uh, jump to user land shellcode. So thoughts here, I, I really like that this post went into more of the exploitation side of things. A lot of the CDI posts we see, they talk about the vulnerability details and the subsystem background information, but they kind of stop there. They don't really go into like some of the exploitation details, which is, I think is kind of a shame when you're talking about kernel because kernel is, is a little bit unique when you get to exploitation. There's unique challenges there that you don't face in user land. So I, I like that they went uh, into those details. So yeah, that's I also... one reason I wanted to kind of shout it out. I also just appreciate, like, you know, they included, well, the cop and Jop and Rop, like, you know, the op family. Um, the fact they include that, like, it's just an example of that, because there's plenty of talk about Rop. There's a lot less talk. Like, I mean, yeah, if you do a lot of the XY write-ups, uh, you look at some of the code, like, if we're dealing with, like, a weaponized exploit, they'll include, like, a cop chain or whatever in there. But it's not some that's really talked about too much in like in terms of as you're learning, like here's how to learn about cop, here's what it kind of looks like. Like I can't think of too many good resources that actually cover those. So it is just nice to see an example of it. They don't really talk about it too much in here, but they do include the proof of concept code. Uh and kind of talk about what they're doing, like they're using the uh cop gadgets to get over to their rob chain, which is generally what happens. I mean, you can you often can't stick inside of like the copper job for very long. Uh, you can just get a few gadgets out of it and then you need to get more into raw, which is more stable to use. It's very hard to get to a like Turing complete like state uh, state in job compared to raw because it's just you're so much more limited on gadgets <clears throat> and uh, what you can control. One thing I will say here uh, that the post didn't seem to mention is to be able to exploit this issue, you would need a separate ASLR defeat, like an info leak to be able to exploit this because you're not going to be able to use these JOP gadgets and ROP gadgets. If you don't know where they are, you need to know the addresses and because of SMEP, you can't use user land gadgets. So, you know, they, they do kind of leave that part out. You, you would need an external bug to chain with this, to be able to full chain it um yeah i feel like that's kind of a given a lot of the time like i, I get why somebody reading it that, yeah. maybe wouldn't realize that but i think it's more notable when you have a single exploit that does both like usually aslr defeats and this is why like a lot of when you're learning about exploit dev a lot of the times like there's such a focus on like here's how you do rop and stuff and not so much on the aslr because it's just like you don't have to do both at the same time too when you're learning uh the aslr step is almost always kind of a separate step from the rest of the exploit it's you have your aslr exploit you have your memory your read gadget or whatever and then you have your write and your code execution uh, so i think it is kind of a given but i could understand why somebody might not realize that 
there are the rare cases where you do have a bug that is so powerful that you can derive an info leak from it. Those bugs are super cool because not having to rely on another bug is obviously very attractive, right? You don't have to worry about that bug being burned ahead of time or you just, you get rid of a dependency, right? So those bugs do exist. They're just rare. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out was the strategy they use here isn't really the safest. So the strategy they use is they jump to a user land mapped shellcode in kernel context. Here's, here's the problem with that. User land memory can be paged out. Um, kernel memory can't, at least not in FreeBSD. In Windows, there is pageable kernel memory, but that's a separate topic. But in, in FreeBSD, if you have a user land page and you go to jump to it and, the, and some other portion of the kernel pages that out when you go to jump to it, you are going to triple fault. You're going to get, you're going to get a fatal crash. Um, I personally wouldn't, I would try to avoid relying on user land memory at all in a kernel exploit. Um, I think I personally would have abused some of the kernel API functions like uh, kmem cache alloc or something like that to put shellcode in kernel memory. That way you never have to worry about it getting paged out and you can just copy the shellcode in there. That does add some extra steps, but it does make it safer in your post exploit chain. Um, so I, th I thought that was kind of an interesting strategy they took. Um, there are things you can try to do to make it less likely or make it impossible that your, you know, shellcode doesn't get paged out. Yeah, I but... mean, this was a pwn to own vulnerability, wasn't it? Am I, am I imagining that? I feel like because so many, okay, I don't see it in the report, so maybe not. I was, my comment was going to be just that, well, I mean, it just needs to hit once during that 15 minute slot, so... As long as they can do that, it's okay. But if this wasn't pwn to own, then even with you know, the ZDI yeah, submissions, just... though, as long as they can trigger like the bug, even if they don't trigger it all the way to like shell, like popping a shell, you know, it's still um they'll still probably take it. Yeah, so. it's still advisory worthy. Um, and thank you, Belika, for the two months with Twitch Prime. Oh yeah, very nice. Thank you. So. Yeah, there's definitely, if you're interested in kernel exploitation, there's some insights to be gained here. This is a really good ZDI post. Unlike some other kernel exploit stuff we've covered, this is extremely accessible. The issue is is pretty straightforward if you understand the, you know, the boundary between user land and kernel a little bit. So I think this could be a good jumping in point for somebody who's interested in kernel exploitation and wants to get into their first exploit. This might be something to look at, although FreeBSD does kind of suck as a system to use. So <laughs> take that as you will. Um, but yeah, I guess technically I said we had two kernel exploits. We technically kind of have three because uh, our last uh, you yeah, know exploit Windows. topic here. Yeah, Windows, uh, WSL2 specifically. So IOActive put out a post about WSL2. So WSL2 was released in May. Uh, it was brought into Windows with the uh, Windows version 2004. And what makes WSL2 so interesting is it's basically a complete rehaul on how the Windows subsystem for Linux works. Instead of just emulating a Linux system, it runs a, a real Linux kernel. Um, and it does that using Hyper-V. So with a real kernel comes more interesting attack surface. So it's not too surprising that we have a topic that covers a driver memory corruption in WSL2. And uh, just, uh, I do want to also shout out that this is actually from one of, well, our only uh, Day Zero mod, uh, Drew. <laughs> right, shout it out that he's one of our community members, I guess. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Ionescu pointed out the fact that there's a driver uh, running in WSL2 VMs for computing direct deck shaders in the kernel. Um, so graphic stuff in the kernel isn't too uncommon. Um, usually stuff like that gets stuck there for efficiency purposes. Um, it's going to run faster than it would in user land because you don't have to worry about like context switches and all that stuff. Um, and this driver is pretty complex. So it has uh, IOctal handlers, uh, IO control. One of these handlers is used for signaling object synchronization. And uh, Drugi mentioned that, you know, it has some code smells. Um, they copied in user data, but they did no validation on the arguments passed into the helper function, <clears throat> at least not immediately. And that's kind of a red flag because usually, especially in kernel, you want to do input validation as quickly as possible. From what I've seen, a lot of kernel devs usually want to get it out of the way and do it up front. That way there's no confusion 
about whose responsibility it is to do validation. Is it the caller's responsibility? Is it the callee's? You just eliminate those problems if you do it up front. Um, so that wasn't being done here, but not only was it not being done up front, it turns out there was no validation being done at all. Um, so, you know, it's not too surprising that code smell led to an issue. Uh, they found some user controlled counts, uh, an object count and a fence count. And if you combine them together for the command size, there's no restrictions on those counts. So you can just overflow. So uh, for clarity's sake, size. um, the object count was being reused as the fence count, I believe. Drugi mentions that. Uh, yeah, args.object count is being used for both object count and fence count. Oh, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, I missed that part. Thank yeah, you. Just, I mean, it doesn't make a huge difference here. The point is you control a count, and then they're doing some size calculations. You know, size of object is the count times the size of the actual object. Size of the fence is the fence count times the size of the fence object. So you win 64T, looks like here. And then they get the command size, adding things together. Exactly what you'd expect. You control it, and overflow, and away you go. Yep. So th what's dangerous about an integer overflow is because it's being used to compute the final size of an allocation, you can overflow it to make the allocation size really small, but then it uses the object count that you passed in, which is really large, and you get an overflow. You know, they don't really work too well together <laughs> when you do something like that. So, um, yeah, another issue that's, you know, not too complicated that's uh, in kernel context this is another one that might be a good jumping in point. Um, in terms of talking about the timeline, uh, it was reported on May 20th, fixed uh, August 26th. Um, one thing I do wonder, though, here is uh, the impact. If you hit the WSL kernel, you would still, you're still hitting a guest, right? So you would still need to escape Hyper-V to be able to hit the host. Am I right on that? I'm I'm assuming it would be because it's being virtualized with Hyper-V, but with Windows, sometimes yeah, you know, but you still are... you have a lot of access. Like WSL two has a lot of access to the root system. Well, so with WSL two, both Windows and a WSL are like both of them are being hypervised. Like both of them are under Hyper-V is my understanding of that system. Uh, so they're just sharing some things between the two. So you can still do a lot just with just with this, not necessarily. Just through the IPC. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I know you just uh, kind of addressed the question in chat, but um, can you explain ZDI will take it today by these exploits? How does that happen? Um, yeah, you basically, they have an email. You have to send it with a PGP key that they give you. Um, but you can send them an email saying, hey, I found this bug uh, with the technical details and they'll reply back to you and say, yeah, we'll buy this or no, we're not interested or it doesn't seem like an issue to us or whatever. Um, basically, how their business model works is they'll purchase uh, proof of concepts and exploits and stuff like that from researchers. Um, people who are on their their customers, like their list, will get advanced notice of the issues and then... Uh, the the reports will eventually go to the vendor as well so zdi is one of those it's not exactly a bug bounty um it's kind of like an exploit broker in a sense but it's more of an accessible one to people um and it's uh the payouts aren't like super high compared to like zero diem if we're yeah, you also getting a don't comparison. need you don't need like a stabilized of an exploit either like they're looking for the issues they do the CVE, they have their own advisory system, as you already mentioned. Uh, so that means, like, you can report things that are probably exploitable and show, like, that it's exploitable, but you don't have to have the consistency of actually selling the exploit. It doesn't uh, have to like be that weaponized. you would with a bro. Yes, that's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. So, like, if you have a bug that relies on an external bug, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, where if you need, like, an ASLR defeat, if you're selling to somebody like Zero Diem, you're probably going to need to chain that. You're, you're going to need that other bug to make it usable. Whereas with ZDI, they are not really going to care. They don't expect you to burn two bugs just to show that one is exploitable. So um, that, that's kind of where ZDI comes into play. Um, I will say, you know, you... Can't really expect super high payouts from them. I want to say their payouts are probably in the under $10,000 range, whereas Zero Diem 
which I think we've covered in the past. They have mobile, like, especially with their mobile stuff, they pay up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but like we were just saying, you know, it's a lot more work to submit to Zero Diem as well. Um, yeah, ZDI does also do like the, if you submit a lot of things and you gain enough points, they have a tier system and then you get more money on top of everything. I mean, it's not a ton more when we're talking about like, you know, 10, maybe 15,000 dollars it's like you get an extra like 10 percent uh so it doesn't bring it up into like the zdi or normal exploit broker range at all uh, yeah but they do have kind of that loyalty program actually the reward system is pretty cool yeah so like after you submit so many issues and meet a threshold you get a multiplier on your future reports and you also get like a, a bonus you know like they'll give you ten thousand dollars or whatever um there's definitely like their incentive system is cool it's just like you said, it's still kind of low paying compared to other options out there. So getting into research, um, we have a Project Zero post, our uh, sole research topic of the episode. So this is posted by uh, Ben Hawks, and it's about attacking the Qualcomm Adreno GPU. So this is a GPU driver that's used in uh, Android devices for Qualcomm chips. It's a powerful driver to hit because it's inside of the Android sandbox. So it can be used as a sandbox escape, which makes it uh, a lot more valuable in the, uh, you know, in the attacker space. So that on its own would be interesting enough, but the fact that it's also hitting something related to the GPU, which I think a lot of people kind of treat as this mystical black box that just, you know, you give it some numbers and it spits out magic because they're just so complicated in how they work. I think that makes this blog post even more fascinating. Um, so that's why I wanted to bring it up. So um, this came off the, the back of the research done by Guang Gong, I think I said that right, um, who reported the bug last year and wrote a white paper about it. Um, but then Ben Hawks noted that the fix wasn't complete. So this is another, this is kind of like the theme of the episode. We have, you know, quite a few issues that, um, you know, were initially fixed, but weren't fixed correctly. So this is another one of those. Um, so the post provides some background info on how the GPU driver works as an overview. Um, basically, the backing buffer for sending commands to a GPU is a ring buffer, which is fairly common from what I know about GPU stuff, which admittedly is fairly limited. Um, but basically, what manages how much space is left in that pointer uh, in that buffer is a pointer stored in scratch memory called the read pointer. Uh, and the attack boils down to getting control over that read pointer which allows you to fool logic to think that there's room left in the ring buffer when there isn't. So you can get like some overwriting happening and corruption inside of the ring buffer. Um, so the original attack abused the fact that this scratch buffer came from a pointer that was allocated at a static GPU address. So part of the patch for that was to try to randomize where that buffer was located, kind of like a ghetto ASLR for GPU memory. Um, Project Zero got around this uh, through two methods. First, they brute forced it because the GPU memory is kind of limited, so it wasn't too hard to guess where it was. Um, and then they had a more precise uh, method they came up with later, which was they found a driver function that actually leaks um, the scratch buffer pointer into the ring buffer for preemption. So there is a second part with how they leverage that control to get an arbitrary read write in physical memory uh, by like shuffling the commands around in the ring buffer and stuff like that. Um, I think that is kind of beyond the scope of what we want to talk about here because it does get like pretty complex there. And, you know, as I said, I'm not like, I'm not into Android or GPU stuff. So I'm, I'm kind of going off of like guessing at that point. So I can't really cover too much into that. But overall, um, this is an interesting article, not only because of it, its ability to be used as a sandbox escape and the GPU aspect I mentioned, but it's also a chipset level issue. So this can affect multiple devices, not just like, it's not just only going to hit Samsung phones, for example. Um, it could hit Samsung phones, Huawei phones, it could hit a, a myriad of phones, it's not vendor tied. Um, and there's also some cool insight here into how GPUs work, at least on Android, and uh, how complex of a subsystem it can be. They even highlight how like bugs can live a long time, and there can be powerful bugs in the GPU precisely because of this complex nature. So... Yeah, yeah. I mean, the post. one thing that I kind of, you touched on this, but that I appreciate with this, they do provide a good bit of background information, similar to you. I've, I've done nothing with, like, GPU exploitation. In fact, like, I mean, it makes sense that you can, but the thought has never even really crossed my mind. Yeah. Um, 
like makes sense but yeah i mean there's just some interesting background here that i think was useful plenty that just goes over my head too but yeah i mean it's a project zero post they're rarely bad see mo like most of the time when you're interacting with the gpu even like if you're a game dev or something you're going to be using something that's in front of the driver. You're not using the driver directly. So you're using like an OpenGL API or something like that. So it's it's not often you get this look into the driver level. So that's where I think this post offers a lot of value beyond just the vulnerability. So yeah, people who are interested in GPUs will probably get something cool out of this. Um, another kind of cool little tidbit of information is i'm pretty sure this is the first p0 post by ben hawks uh since he's come back to technical uh to a technical role at p0 because i think for a while he was like the project lead or whatever and he was in more of a managerial position but uh he mentioned when he tweeted out this this link that this was his first uh, major technical thing since coming back and he's he's really happy to be back on the technical side of things so you know that's pretty cool for uh for him and, uh, you know, judging by this article, it'll, it'll be cool to see future articles that he writes as well. So, I think that pretty much covers all of our topics. We're going to move into our shout-outs uh, right at the end of the episode. So, first, uh, Google CTF. Google CTF took place uh, on August 22nd to August 23rd. Um, the challenge source code and exploits were released a few days ago on GitHub. So, for those interested in CTF stuff... That's probably worth checking out. And did you play Google CTF? No, I haven't played any CTFs. <laughs> yeah, I got a I busy didn't, summer, so didn't think um, so. Yeah, I I kind of got suckered into playing one challenge, but yeah, I didn't play it either. Which challenge did you play? Uh, Tasterize. It, it was like somebody had asked a question. I did. It was like a five minutes beginner web question. Oh, um, oh, okay. So like, I don't have much to talk about with that. Or anything Fair to enough. talk about for it. Um, I was thinking maybe you had played it, though. No, I've always been kind of thinking about going back to CTFs, but I, I just never have. I've been busy with other stuff. And um, CTFs in general, I think, have been rubbing me the wrong way a little bit. Like, I remember I looked into some CTF stuff in the beginning of the year, and some of the stuff that I looked at was just kind of bizarre as challenges. They were, like, really obscure, like... Yeah, I mean, um, that's that's the thing. A lot of challenges... Give it the issues. I've kind of mentioned how there's been a definite shift in challenge design over the years. Now, I don't feel like... There are some designers who generally do a good job still. Uh, like, I I don't... I guess I can't really say for this year's Google CTF, but in general, I haven't felt that way about uh, Google's challenges. But the the problem is, like, people... Like, teams have just gotten so much better over the years, and it's kind of been that continuing growth. It's hitting that point where it's like you've got to make a challenge that's still challenging and engaging to like the top level teams. And to do that, while CTF challenges have always kind of been a bit contrived, you're also getting a little bit more gimmicky now. It's not just hard exploit dev, it's now hard exploit dev plus obscure knowledge. Yeah. Um, and that difference, I think, is kind of... Yeah, I haven't played as many CTFs in the last few years either, as more of them have started to re just require uh, more gimmicky things. Which, I mean, to be fair, like, I'm not using that to be against CTFs at all. Like, I do think CTFs are still, still can be fun. If you're into that, like, go for it. It's still a good way to learn. Uh, but, oh no, I just kind of... Similar to you, kind of has just left a bad taste in my mouth. It's not really the, it's not my go-to anymore. I don't enjoy it as much as I used to. I think it's part of the, like, the problem is that CTFs are catering more to the bigger teams, which, fair enough, I mean, you're running a competition, so that makes sense. Yeah, But no, at the same time, that kind of leaves the individuals and smaller teams behind, you know? Yeah, no, and that's the thing, like, it is a competition, these things make sense you need to make it hard you need to make it engaging to those teams uh so like i don't fault ctfs at all for it it's just it's no longer really all that enjoyable for me like i said i'll occasionally just like join in if i see people playing one i'll you know i i like to spitball ideas and stuff with um during a ctf but 
I don't go out of my way for them anymore. Yeah, it's just an unfortunate reality. Nobody's really to blame for it. Um, somebody from chat, uh, the unethical sleuth, mentioned uh, Jan Horn from P Zero made Pwn Gate Key. That's pretty cool. I I actually I didn't know that. Um, Jan Horn, for those who don't know, Google Google guy, um, does like Android stuff. I I think the Android binder issue was actually was him and Maddie Stone. So, um, you know, that's a cool little uh, tidbit to bring up. That being said, we'll move on from Google CTF, though, um, to another shout-out. <clears throat> this one's about Ida Pro. Uh, this is a, I like this title, Ida Pro Tips to Add to Your Bag of Tricks. So this one just talks about some Ida tips you may or may not know about, like uh, <clears throat> how you can align structures, um, the Alt-T combination for text searching, setting conditional breakpoints. Um, you know, there, there's some in here that, you know, a lot of people listening might know. But there's also some some other ones in there that you might not know and, you know, might help you out in whatever your endeavors you're doing. So uh, it's definitely worth checking out, even just glancing at some of the stuff, looking at the subtitles and seeing if that's uh, interesting to you. And then finally, we have a post from uh, Crystal Gamers Layer, reverse engineering Marvel's Avengers developing a server emulator. Um, I know we do, there is like a big overlap with the reverse engineering community and games. Um, so for those of you interested in game hacking and private server development and stuff like that, this, uh, this might be interesting to you. We've actually, we've covered this person before, uh, and they, they made some interesting blog posts. I, what was the exact nature of the last one? Like we covered, I think it was a, it was like an older game console or something, right? Um, I can't try and look it up here. Um, I don't recall offhand though. Yeah, I'm just thinking about it now. I, I should have got it beforehand, but you know. Yeah, it looks like episode 23 um uh spider-man 2000 the buffer overflow right and file yeah. loading yeah yeah now i remember that yeah so um the source code and binary has also been released so uh, that could be interesting for you but um yeah that basically concludes our shout outs uh z i don't you don't have any shout outs do you nope any last minute ones all right so we'll wrap up the show here uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in. You can catch the VODs on Twitch or on YouTube 24 hours after the stream. Uh, we also have previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more links on Anchor as well. Um, keep an eye out for those discussion videos uh, that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, I think we're planning on doing those on Thursdays. So, uh, you know, we'll put out an announcement on the Discord and the Twitter when those are out. So make sure to join our Discord and follow us on Twitter if you want to join the community. But uh, yeah, with that being said, we'll be back next Monday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific with episode 45, and we will see you guys then.